It's interesting, actually. Uh, other than calling John, uh, oh, I don't know, you know, every year or so, uh, or a couple, to you know, inquire whether he'd like to uh, once again do an interview, which I always got the big no to. Uh, you know, that's about the level that we've, uh, I think, kept in touch uh, over the years. And then the other day, uh, I happened to call him. And other than the fact that I bugged you once again, John, I really am curious, after 10 years, why break your silence now and welcome. Well, thank you, Art. You mean I could have said no? <laughs> yeah, too, too late. <laughs> yeah, you could have said no, sure. Um, I'm serious. Uh, after after ten years of not a peep, uh, why now? Well, you know, uh, the the government in charge of this cover up uh, works so well at uh, making your life miserable when you go around talking at this uh, about this stuff that I quit and my life quality of life improved about two hundred percent. But now the cover-up is so well in place that uh, they certainly would not be threatened by me going on the radio once yeah. and uh, and saying what I know. Yeah, well, you lost jobs because of this, right? Yeah, I lost two. I lost one uh, with an airline and uh, one with uh, a government program that I, I really wanted, and that was with Lockheed. And they went for my clearance, and they were told by the Air Force of NASA that under no circumstances uh -huh. would John Lear ever get another clearance. Now, I had Q clearance up at the test site uh, for for some work I did with um, Dynelectron, and it was just monitoring uh, below-ground tests from the air with different airplanes. Uh, but uh, And that clearance is still there. It's not active. But uh, they weren't going to renew it under any circumstances, and, and they made it. They made it plain, so it's cost me a little bit, but <clears throat> I've managed to survive. Um, all right. Uh, you know, before we launch into the whole spectrum of things that we have to talk about, John, uh, when you and I were on the phone the other day, you began to tell me about 9-11, and I really would like to talk about that. Um, you have a lot, you have a perspective on the whole 9-11 thing that people should at least hear. I mean, everybody can make up their own minds about it, but you're a commercial pilot, and there's certain things you know. Uh, so how about it? Well, it's a very sensitive subject, and I told you that I was hesitant to talk about it. That, that's why I'm bringing it up first. <laughs> but uh, whoever concocted 9-11, and, and it certainly wasn't uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, they had two objectives. One was to polarize American opinion against Arab Muslims. And number two was to get uh, the U.S., to trick the U.S., essentially, to get Osama out of Afghanistan, because Osama, as bad as he was, he was shutting down all the heroin poppy fields and was causing a disastrous monetary loss to the illegal drug industry. And uh, last year, which is a year after we went into Afghanistan, uh, National Geographic did a special on TV that ran for several months and documented the 500% um, increase in drugs flowing out of Afghanistan uh, after we went in there and eliminated, eliminated Osama. They actually did. I, re I recall that. I remember that report. Um, so you're sort of charging that we went in there after Osama to r rescue the drug trade. No. Well, well, that wasn't that. That wasn't what we thought. We were tricked into doing that. We were tricked okay. into thinking that Osama was responsible for 9/11. But to get in a proper perspective on who did uh, the World Trade Center, uh, uh, you have to understand what a magnificent feat of airmanship this was. It, it was disastrous and it was horrible for this country. But. This was not accomplished by some guys who went to Florida and got some instruction in a Cessna or a Piper. And this was not accomplished by somebody who had some right team in a 727. Well, what about simulators, flight simulators? This had to be accomplished by pilots who were taken to an honest-to-God Boeing 757 simulator, which essentially is, uh, you know, the 757 and 767 are essentially the same cockpit. You get the same rating. And whoever, you know, concocted this whole thing knew that on a particular day that airplanes, uh, air, uh, airliners themselves could be switched because of, you know, maintenance problems. And uh, by selecting airlines that had that airplane, they had everything covered. Huh. So 
uh, it actually took a fair amount of skill to plow into those buildings? I would say that uh, it took about two or 300 hours for each pilot, and we're talking about... Two or 300 hours? Of, uh, you mean of simulator time? Of simulator time. Uh, they had to learn how to uh, step into the cockpit, and, and that's a, a whole thing, getting into the airplane, but separate from that, they had to get in the cockpit, pull the circuit breaker for the transponder, sit in the pilot seat, disconnect the autopilot from the flight management system, turn the airplane, push the throttles all the way forward, find Manhattan, then line up on a pre-planned course doing 10 miles a minute. They were clocked by air traffic control doing 600 miles an hour at 700 feet above the ground and fly directly into the middle of the center of the World Trade Center. Now that, you know, in the air races, we only fly 400 miles an hour, uh -huh. and that's difficult. But to fly an airliner the size of the 757 at 700 feet, I mean, that, that, took some, that took some skill, and it took a long time to train that, probably a year. <laughs> that's, now, that's in a addition to that, hitting the trail, air trade center was a feat, but hitting the Pentagon was even more of a feat because when you're going that fast, there's a tremendous amount of air creating this lift and as you head towards the ground that air reacts against the wing and pushes you up so whoever whoever hit that uh, train to hit that pentagon at the third uh, story was highly trained because when he got towards the ground he'd be getting a tremendous amount of lift and he would have to, have to trim forward and push with an incredible amount of strength to not be pushed up and over the pentagon and to hit huh. the third story what about the plane that went down, the one that didn't make it, that was probably headed for the White House? Uh, well, that was shot down by an F-16 out of um, a base south of um, New York. And uh, How can you be so sure? Well, because there was parts found five miles away, uh, because there was eyewitnesses to it being shot down. Uh, there's corroborating evidence, somebody who was listening to a... Uh, cell phone conversation at the time this was going on said they heard the rapid like the, and described it as the pilot rapidly turning pages well that's not what was happening it was the cannon fire hitting the fuselage and that's what accounted for the uh, what they called smoke in the uh, cabin it wasn't smoke it was the depressurization causing the condensation so you're saying definitely you, you feel it was shot down no doubt about it but you have to understand the government's position. Number one, they they couldn't possibly reveal this information because it was to you know something they had to do. The problem was that once we the passengers got control of the airplane, there was no way to communicate with with air traffic control and communicate with who was ever was directing uh, the attack for the air force. Now you say Osama bin Laden wasn't responsible, but there are videotapes showing Osama with his lieutenant sort of laughing and joking they didn't expect uh, such a grand result and all that baloney. What about that? He may have been told at the last minute that, but uh, if that's all we've got, people say, well, how come we haven't got Osama bin Laden? And, mm -hmm. and the bottom line is we don't want to get him. We'd have to put him on trial. And other than uh, that uh, videotape, we don't have a shred, not a shred of evidence again. Um, yet that might be enough in, in a, it might be enough in a court. In a world right? court? Yeah. Maybe, well, I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe you're right. Uh, maybe there is no more evidence. I don't know. Uh, but you, you shocked me with some of your views on the, on the 9-11 business. No question about that. Uh, you just, I mean, hundreds of hours of simul. Where would they get, uh, John, where would they get simulator training like that, that many hours? Therein lies the problem, because they certainly couldn't waltz into any airline in the United States and get that kind of time. I mean, most of the airliners, uh, uh, or, or airlines who have 7 by 7s using 24 hours a day. And uh, they certainly aren't in the habit of renting uh, to unauthorized people like... Uh, Somebody going in there and saying, hey, we need 1,500 hours of time. It's just yeah. not going to happen. They had to find another 757 elsewhere in the world. And you look around the Middle East, and there's certainly none there, because, at least in any Arab country, because uh, they have Airbuses, uh, strictly uh, Airbuses from France. So, so they have to find someplace else that had a 757. How many of these simulators are there? 
Well, there's lots of them, but, uh, you know, not lots of them, but, you know, there's certainly around it. They had to make a deal somewhere. I mean, obviously they got training uh, because they couldn't do without that kind of kind of training. But, but what we've been given by the media, the mass media, you know, that they were down in Florida getting a few hours uh, on lighter aircraft, that just doesn't wash at all. No huh? possibility. Uh, you, you talk to any pilot that knows anything about this and and that was that was a feat of airmanship uh with 19,000 hours and all the air and the airplanes I've flown including air races uh, the Douglas B26 I doubt if I could have done that the first time because really? what you're doing is you're going a mile every 6 seconds uh so you had to learn where to line up which you know which reference points to get what you know where you had to be at a particular time to hit that building, it was just you know it had to be planned for a long, long time. This was this is a tremendous amount of skill, and it, and it took a long time to do. Particularly, you know, they probably got somebody who didn't have you know thousands of hours. They probably had to uh, you know train him from the ground up. And in in this case, it was relatively easy because he didn't have to learn how to take off or land. He didn't have to learn how to do a single engine approach. You didn't have to learn how to do an ILS or an NDD approach or anything like that. Just hit a building. Yeah. Just hit a building. John, here's something I've wanted to ask you, John, for a long time. Phil Class is a, um, uh, I guess a skeptic would be a kind word. Um, he's uh, perhaps more than a skeptic. And I talked to somebody who claimed they heard a quote from you uh, saying that in a conversation with, uh, oh, let me redo this line here. In a conversation with someone, you, you were quoted as saying that Phil Class does what he does out of patriotism. Did, did Phil Class ever say that to you? No. No. Uh, I knew Phil Class from the early 60s when he was the science editor or the, um, I forget, electronic editor for the Los Angeles Times, and he used to write about my dad's equipment in an unfavorable in nature, and so mm -hmm. he was an anathema around our house. And then when I got into this UFO thing and, and met him in, uh, I forget, one of the conferences in 1987, I went over to, he invited me over to his apartment, and we sit there and uh, sat there and talked about this stuff, and, and he was, uh, you know, saying, oh, you know, this is all... BS is not true, and I'd hit him with you know several facts. He says, John, 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 it's you know it's not true. It's it's the fiction. It never happened. And at that time, Larry, um, who was the Bentwaters guy that came out uh, and and talked about the Bentwaters thing? Oh, I, I and I should know who you're remember talking Larry? about. Larry, so yes, yes, yes. I remember. I can't remember his last name and. And I talked, started talking about him. He says, John, I don't want you hanging around that guy. He's a druggie. And uh, it was an interesting evening. And uh, uh, but you know, I, I think that's about the last time I ever saw Phil. Is he still alive? Um, I believe uh, Phil Class is indeed alive. Uh -huh. um, uh, I think he is anyway. <laughs> uh, listen, uh, a lot of people listening tonight uh, will have no idea of you and the year of Lazar for you. A lot of a lot of people. Uh, of course, are pretty recent listeners, and gee, it's been a decade, uh, although we have interviewed, I actually interviewed Bob Lazar not too long ago, uh, John. Yeah, I listened to it. Oh, you did? You heard it? Yeah. Um, it might be really interesting to kind of get uh, that period of time, you know, from, from you, uh, for all the new listeners. There are so many. I spent some time with Bob um, a month or so ago. I had an occasion to ferry an L-1011 uh, from uh, where it was painted in the south, it, the name of the airport escapes me, but we took it up to Roswell, and as you know, Roswell is a huge airport rep repository for old airplanes, not old, well, yeah, old airplanes, old airliners, there must be 200 of them there, just every kind that you can imagine, L-1011s and 747s and DC-10s and DC-9s. And They're really kept there for, uh, to avoid the erosion that would occur elsewhere, right? Just yeah. because it's well, there's desert several places. Southwest. Mojave is one. Victorville is another. Mm -hmm. uh, Roswell. Anyway, I went to Roswell, and, and um, coming back, I took the bus from Roswell to Albuquerque, and uh, Bob picked me up, and I spent a few days at his house. And, you know, talked about old times and stuff, and it was interesting. But, 
you know, the way I got into all of this <clears throat> was in sometime in 1984 or 85, I picked up a book called Missing Time by Bud Hopkins. Of course. And when I read it, I thought, holy smokes, this is true. I mean, it gave me chills. And at that time, I was flying with uh, American Trans Air, and uh, I was based in New York, and I gave Bud a call and uh, ended up over at his house and uh, spent a fascinating evening with him. And... Um, and that got me really interested. And then, uh, what's his name? Whitley Stryber wrote Communion. Mm -hmm. And that was even more scary. I remember reading that book, uh, on a, I had gone down to the store to get it, and I got a call to take a flight from Las Vegas to Cleveland. And I remember flying the 727 on the way to Cleveland and reading this thing, uh, and how scary it was. But anyway, uh, I got interested in all this, and, and, um, uh, Oh, let's see what happened next. I uh, went on this little tour around uh, Colorado, New Mexico, and, you know, checking out all these rumors. It was just fascinating. Uh, and then I started to give lectures, and I, I gave this. At that time, I was on my soapbox, and we deserve to know this stuff. And, you know, at that time, I, I had no idea how heavily involved the government was in this. I thought they were just really dismissing it. You, you kind of went at this uh, for a while as almost an obsession, didn't oh, you? Oh, it was an obsession, and it and it almost caused a divorce because my wife, you know, turned off the phone. I mean, changed my numbers, and and uh, it, it was a very, very uh, turbulent time. But anyway, uh, in the summer of 1988, uh, a guy called up uh, during all this turbulence, and and uh, he said, "Hey, I'd like to get a copy of your tapes." And I said, "No, I I'm out of this. I'm done with it. It's it's a mess." And he said, "Well, he said if you ever need uh, an appraisal of your house, he said uh, I'll trade you." For, he says, "I'm an appraiser," and I said, "Well, I'll tell you what. I need my house appraised. Uh, I'll <laughs> trade you the tapes for the appraisal." And this this was Gene Huff. <laughs> yeah. Oh yes. So. He came over and he brought this guy named Bob Lazar to hold the measuring tape. And we sat down and we talked about UFOs, and Bob was sitting there rolling his eyes. He said, I've never heard so much BS in all my life. I mean, this is, he said, I, have a, I work, worked at uh, Los Alamos. He said, if this were true, I would have known it. I had the highest clearance. And, you know, the people who have Q clearance think that's the highest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, anyway, over the next few months, uh, we got together with Gene and Bob, and, and I kept feeding Bob information, and like about October or November, it became apparent to him that something was going on. And I think there was two or three things that I had said. One, as I said, at Los Alamos, there's a facility called YY-2, which is a secret facility, and that's where they keep you know, the live alien. And I mentioned something else. I forget what it was. But anyway, his friends at Los Alamos wrote him back and said, you know, indeed there is a YY-2. Now, that doesn't mean there's an alien there, but there was a secret area. So at any, any uh, uh, rate, Bob decided to reenter the scientific community and call Dr. Teller. I was there when he made the call, uh, reminded Dr. Teller of when he had met him at Los Alamos and asked if he could uh, reenter the uh, scientific community. And Teller said, you want to work here in Livermore, California, or you want to work out there in uh, Nevada? And Bob said, I want to work at Area 51. Uh -huh. And Teller said, let me see what I can do. Well, the next thing I know is uh, Bob has three security interviews down at uh, the EG&G facility here. And he mentioned to me on the second interview, they said, you know, what is your relation? do you know John Lear and what is your relationship with him? And Bob said, uh, well, he's a person who uh, I know him, and he's a person who sticks his nose where it doesn't belong. And Bob said when he told them that, what he didn't tell them was he likes to stick his nose where it doesn't belong. <laughs> so anyway, the next thing I know is uh, December of 1988, Bob shows up at my house in the evening, sits down, I'm you know, right now doing some paperwork, and he sits down in the chair in front of my desk, and he says, I saw a disc today. Yeah, now, here's where I want to stop you and, and ask you a, a quick question. W w you know, when Bob first came to you at the point you're, you're talking about right now, what do you think his motivation was? Because um, he, of course, he had a... a he said a, what his motivation was. Yes. He, 
he said, it's our disc today. And I said, what are you talking about? There, I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. And I said, did you go to Area 51? He said, yeah. He said, I just got back. I said, then what are you doing here, Bob? I said, this is fantastic. Why don't you work there? Yeah, obviously, they followed you. And I said, why don't you find out what's going on and then tell me? And he said, because you have taken so much flack over this, yep. and so much ridicule, I want to tell you it's true that I saw it. So you think he that was, was his motive? He was coming to you pri privately at that point, yeah. uh, just saying, "Look, what you believe, it's true. That's I can right. I can verify it's true." Right. So it was just a, it was just because of your friends. And That's be right. Because he saw your struggle. Right. And from that point. Well, from that point, uh, you know, he kept he, he was uh, he worked from uh, uh, December until March twenty first, nineteen eighty nine, which will always be a date that we'll always remember. And that you know, the Tuesday before the twenty first was a Wednesday. Uh, the day before, when I was over at his house, and he said, "You want to go d see a disc fly tomorrow?" And I said, <laughs> "Well, how?" And he said, "Well, I know a place." That we can watch it, and they always test on Wednesdays at sunset because that is the time that this road is uh, least traveled. And I said, "Great, let's go." So Gene Huff and me and and Bob got in my motor home, and I I think Bob's wife was with us, and we drove up there and uh, just south of what the black mailbox, which we didn't know about then. The the now infamous black mailbox. Right, and we we I set up this telescope. And uh, here this thing comes up from behind the mountains where uh, Groom Lake was. And it flitted around, and I'm trying to focus this 8-inch Celestron telescope, which is, you know, very difficult. Bad idea. And uh, But finally I got it. Oh, and got it. Uh, I saw, you know, a disc. It was uh, oriented uh, about 45 degrees to the horizon, and it was, it was glowing. It was, uh, it was a yellowish-orange, and it was glowing. And it was settling back down uh, behind the mountains. And I said, quick, Gene, take a look. And <laughs> as I stepped back from the telescope, I hooked the, the tripod leg mm. and got it off and, and uh, uh, off the focus. And, of course, there's a big laugh about that. And, and at one time I had those, those tapes, all those tapes, but... I'm moving out of my house now, and I stored everything in the garage as far as tapes, UFO books, all documents and everything, and somebody came and stole half of it, including all my UFO books, everything. Now, I don't know who it was, and I don't expect it. You know, uh, I think it was just accident somebody took that stuff. Uh -huh. That tape is gone. Well, uh, a, a telescope of that power would actually give you pretty good resolution if you really managed the getting the, and holding the focus course. Oh, it was it was perfect. I saw it. There was no doubt about it. How, it, was, it was how much could you see, John, beyond a glowing disc? Was, that was, was it. it. That was it. That was it. No yeah. further detail of yeah. the craft itself, or could you even estimate um, by distance the size? Yeah. Right. And uh, so we, we stayed around for another couple of hours, and nothing happened. So we went home, and then the next Wednesday night, I was on a trip, uh, airline trip, and I couldn't go, but I called Bob, and I said, uh, you know, what's going on? He said, we're going fishing tonight, huh. which I knew, you know, they're going up to Groom Lake. And uh, so that was the night that I think... Uh, Jim Taliani went and uh, George Knapp went, and I think that's when George got the film that he got. Then the, the third night, which was the following Wednesday, was March 6th, and that's when we uh, went up and we had all the, you know, the Geiger counters and the cameras and everything, and, and that's when we got caught. And we were going down the road uh, that, that uh, access to the back gate of uh, Groom Lake, and I kept saying, come on, let's... Let's stop here. This how how close place. How close were you allowed to get? About 10 miles. 10 miles. So you were how far inside that 10-mile point? Uh, I think we were about 10, 10 miles away. We hadn't even come near the security gate. That's way up in the, you know, in the ridge there. So uh, well, I guess what I'm getting at is, were you in an area where you could legally be? Or... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, all right. But we were going further, and I said, come on, let's stop. And... and uh, and then we saw some headlights in front of us, and uh, you know we said, okay, let's let's turn around. There's no use in enforcing this issue because we're not going to be able to get out now. And as we turned around, 
I forget who was driving. I think it was uh, Bob's wife's sister. And I said, now, don't get stuck in the dirt. And so we turned around and we head as fast as we can down this road, and these, these jeeps or vehicles are following us. And, I've, you know, when I've told this story, I said there was four, and, you know, Bob says, no, there was only two, or I forget how many there was. But anyway, we got to a point almost to the road, and we decided they were too close behind us. So we, I said, let's, he says, Bob says, I can't afford to get caught. Let's stop. I'm going to go into the desert. You guys, you know, do what you have to do. And uh, so we got out. Bob went into the desert. I set up the telescope, and these guys pull up, form a circle. They had guns. They said, what are you guys doing? And uh, I said, um, we're just, uh, you know, looking at the stars. He said, well, how come you were running away from us? And I said, well, I thought you might be uh, dopers. And uh, he said, well, we're not. And he said, um, Let's, we need to see some ID. So everybody had to, you know, give the Social Security number and driver's license number. And we were there about a half an hour. They checked everything, and uh, they said, then they gave us the briefing. They said, look, we can't kick you off of here. This is BLM land. But we can make it awful difficult for you if you stay. And we said, okay, we'll go. So they leave. And remember, this is at night. It's extremely dark, way out in the middle of Nevada. Mm -hmm. And we had the trunk open, which cast a light. And I'm loading the stuff, and uh, we wait about 15 minutes, and Bob comes out of the desert. And uh, we sit there laughing and joking about seeing flying saucers and all this and so on and so on. Unbeknownst to us, the security team had gone down the road just about 100 yards, and they were filming us, and they had a parabolic reflector they were recording what we were saying oh so we pack up everything and we go we get on the road there just um, as it goes through just where it meets the the uh, 278 and as we get onto the road the uh, I think it's Nye County or Lincoln County Sheriff stops us oh and they pull up they got the uh, the lights going and they got the bullhorn and he says uh, all right, you know, everybody out, put your hands on the uh, on the car. And so we get out and put the hands on the car, and and uh, he comes over, and uh, we were there about an hour. He checked ID, and he was talking to somebody, and uh, pretty soon he comes up and he says, Look, I only have two questions. He says, One, where's the gun? Because we had mentioned that Bob had run into the desert with a gun. And he said, I want to know why there's five people here and there was only four people when security stopped you in there. Huh. And so nobody said anything. Um, I have to admit that I had I made one of the monumental mistakes of my life, and Bob Lazar will never, ever forgive me for this. But uh, it's just my nature. When they asked for the driver's license, I said, mine's in the trunk. <laughs> huh. And so we had to open the trunk with yes. all the Geiger counter and film and everything in there. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, after about an hour of hemming and hawing and not giving him an answer to anything, he said, uh, and, and I'll remember this officer's name. Uh, it, it's a French name, and he, he still works up there for Lincoln County. And I see him occasionally from time to time. He said, look said, I don't know why I've been told to do this, but I've been told to let you guys go. So pack up your stuff and get out of here. So we packed up our stuff and, and left. And uh, the next morning, Bob got a call from his boss. You, said, you, uh, but if I can stop you, John, do you think the reason you were let go is because of the Lazar name? Right. Yeah, yeah, okay. And they didn't I want any more so, uh, publicity, so... The next morning, Bob gets a call from his boss and uh, says, Bob, don't go to work. I'm going to pick you up. And he picked him up, drove him up to um, Indian Springs, which is the center for all security for the test site. And they pulled him out of a car with a gun in his ear, and they said, Bob, when we gave you this security clearance, it didn't mean you were supposed to tell all your friends about the flying saucers. Uh, do you want to work here or not? And he was noncommittal. He came home and, you know, told us about, you know, what happened. And I said, he going back to work? And he said, probably not. Oh. 
Uh-huh. And I said, why? He said, the main reason is because the last time I went up, he said, when I got on that, the, the only thing I remember is getting on the 737 and getting off. I don't remember what I did up there. And he said, I couldn't work under conditions like that. All right. Hold it right there, John. Uh, good evening, everybody. You're listening to uh, a very rare interview indeed. My guest is John Lear, the son of Bill Lear, inventor of the Lear Jet, and a man who knows an awful lot about what's going in on inside. Actually, so much inside information that I doubt we'll hear it all tonight, but we'll see how much we can get to. It's been so long since I interviewed John that the last time we did it, we almost didn't have commercials. <laughs> okay, John, we kind of left off where Bob essentially said, nah, he didn't think he'd go back to work there. Yeah, and his reason was is because uh, the last time he went, he could remember getting on the 737 and getting off, but he couldn't remember what he did there. So, the uh, short, I think it was the next day or so, like the Saturday, I had done, uh, or it was Sunday morning, uh, I had done some interviews with George Knapp, and it was, I forget what the program was called, but we discussed uh, UFOs and everything, and that night he called me, he said, John, you can't believe it, the, the phones are ringing off the hook here, people want more, what, what can I do for an encore? <laughs> and I said, well, maybe I can get Bob to come on. And so that, I talked with Bob, and that was the uh, the Monday night that he did the new show where they showed him in uh, uh, in shadow, telling that he worked up there and that he worked on extraterrestrial craft. Oh, that was a big broadcast. And then uh, a few days later, uh, George Knapp and Bob Stoldow, who, was, who headed up uh, Channel 8, came up, and uh, George said, uh, I have Bob here, we want to talk to... Uh, uh, I have Bob Stold out here. We want to talk to Lazar, and uh, we want to see if he's telling the truth, and I want to go ahead with a special. He said I need to get Bob Stold out his permission. So we sat here for an hour or two, and they grilled Bob this way and that, and finally said, uh, Bob Stold out said, go ahead, do it. And that's when George went with the, uh, with his, the uh, six, I think it's a six-part documentary on, on Lazar. Yeah. Very famous documentary. Um, uh, Channel Eight stayed really stayed heavily on that. And uh, anyway, so that was it uh, for you and Bob. That was pretty much it. Uh, Bob made the uh, the Lazar tape, which uh, documented uh, what he learned up there. And uh, we stayed in touch for many years. We ran uh, he ran Desert Blast every year up until. Uh, Desert Blast 13 was the last one that we ran. It was the largest outlaw fireworks show <laughs> in, west of the Mississippi. And uh, we we didn't do it again for for several reasons. One was because we had 13 shows with just tremendously high explosive displays, and there wasn't one single injury. And, and Bob said, look, we've, we've gotten away with this long enough. Let's... let's bring this to a close. So. Okay, somebody, I've got a computer here, and people can send me questions kind of as we go along, and some somebody um, was asking, you know, well, uh, that proves that uh, Lazar knew the schedule, roughly, of what was happening up there. It doesn't necessarily prove the rest of his story. Um, how, how confident are you that everything we, and you were told by Lazar, was uh, right on the money? You know, I'm confident that everything he told me was true, and and I've heard that argument several times that he may have known the schedule, but and then they also say he may have been a cook up there. So, but if he was a cook, then that means that they told the cooks when they were going to fly the flying saucers. <laughs> yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> that's a very good point. Uh, but, but in general, uh, there's no way I can prove you know all that happened. I can just say I believe it. Um, and of course, you you can believe what you saw with your own eyes. Yeah. Um, do you have uh, how much of an idea do you have with regard to the capability of the craft that you saw fly? Fly is the wrong word, I guess. Well, Bob said it you know had tremendous capabilities. It could go, certainly travel outside you know this solar system and and go to other solar systems. Uh, the fuel that, you know, he worked on the propulsion system. When, when you go to work there, 
everything is so compartmentalized other than the initial briefing that he got where he learned a little about, you know, everything that was going on. He, they don't allow him to work on all aspects of it. He had to, he had to uh, pick one field, and his field that he picked on was try to duplicate the propulsion with present-day technology. And, of course, it's impossible. There are hundreds of thousands of years ahead of us, although we can understand how it works. There is no way we contain, uh, can contain an antimatter reactor. John, uh, Bob got his hands on Element 116, uh, crucial to the um, operation, I guess, of these craft, this Element 116. That's think, the fuel. Yeah, the fuel. And um, did, did he, you remember, you don't have to answer these things if you don't want to, but did he bring that to your home? No, it was at his house. It was at his house. You saw it yourself? Yes. Huh. Um, what became of the um, element 116 that he possessed? No comment. No comment. Okay. Um, you're, let me ask you something easy, or maybe, maybe it's not easy. Uh, you're a pilot. You've been a pilot all your adult life, I guess, correct? Yeah. Hmm. Something a lot of us wonder is how many pilots see these craft. Um, a lot of people, I, you know, I, I've noticed something, John. Uh, you get more, a lot more UFO sightings when, you know, Mars is coming close and people are paying attention to the sky. Most people go around looking at what's in front of them or the road or whatever, and they have to. They don't spend a lot of time looking at the sky. Ah, but pilots do. They spend a lot of time looking at the sky, and uh, many of us wonder how many pilots actually see these things. That's really a misconception because when you're flying an airplane, particularly uh, in this day and age, you're concentrating on what's going on inside the cockpit. Uh, during the nighttime, even if the lights are turned down, there's no way you can see out the windows. I mean, I mean, you can press your eyeball against the window and see stars, but it's not like you're sitting there in your normal piloting position and you can see outside. You can't. Uh, and then during the daytime, uh, you know, you just, your, your attention isn't outside. I mean, you can look out occasionally from time to time, but most of your concentration is inside. You're talking with air traffic control, uh, you're monitoring, uh, you know, the, the, uh, instruments and, and paying attention to flying. You don't so have to then, then but in answer to your questions, how many people see? Not many. I've heard some stories of guys, see uh, stuff outside and, and of course I may have been a little different I spent a lot more time looking outside um, I remember one of the last flights that I made with uh, one of the cargo airlines uh, were very late at night and I'm looking out and I see this thing come streaking across the sky and then go straight up and I thought no gosh I wish I had a the crew had seen that, uh -huh. and uh, so then I didn't say anything, and then it happened again. And I thought, well, maybe it'll happen again. So I said, hey, you guys, look look at this. And it happened three more times, and it was, you know, I don't know what it was, but it came streaking about halfway across the horizon directly over the airplane and then shot straight up. Huh. I, uh, okay. Um I, it's a million things I want to ask you about. Um, for example, uh, Richard C. Hoagland, um, early in the early years, uh, had some shocking stuff he said about things that are on our moon. Just incredible things, tall spires and structures and buildings and things, and just incredible stuff, and, and people laugh. Uh, they ought not be laughing at that, huh? No, Richard C. Hoagland inspired me to to look into that, and uh, I ordered some prints from NASA. And of course, when you order pictures of the moon from NASA, it doesn't come from NASA. There's three separate uh, places where they come from. And uh, to go back to the middle '60s, when NASA really realized what was going on 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 the moon, they had the Lunar Orbiter series. There was five. Uh, camera ships they sent to the moon to make fabulous detailed photographs of the moon mm. and when these came back I mean they were chock full of all these buildings and arches and, and uh, 
domes and and buildings and you know there was a, a place at NASA where people spent their entire careers doing nothing but airbrushing this stuff out and then they'd take a picture of that picture and that would become the public information that would become the picture that was sent out to the public but every once in a while you can order a picture and they forgot to airbrush or they didn't know it and one thing they could have never imagined back in the early 60s was that in the 90s that computer technology would make it possible that we could scan a photograph like that and you know enlarge it and find the airbrush marks yes. uh, and find stuff that they didn't see you know looking at the at the print I mean, we can go right down and see, you know, little, you know, tracks and, and uh, all kinds of stuff. So you think they're just erasing this stuff, like, or have erased this stuff like crazy? Oh, absolutely. To, they, you to know, protect they just, us uh, from the truth. They, they just have a hard time keeping up with, uh, you know, keeping this information from the public. I mean, you know, every time... We send something to Mars, something happens, it doesn't work, it oh, doesn't I know. transmit everything. We sent Clementine to the moon, That's took right. all these fabulous pictures and spun out of control. You know, yeah, I think the guys at NASA say, you know, how many times can we do this? You think the public's going to fall for this every single time? And, and I imagine some guy says, well, they have so far. Let's keep it up. Well, then you've been following uh, Richard's career to some degree. Absolutely. Uh, what, a, what a guy. Uh, all right. Well, like a year ago. Uh, John, uh, he suddenly came up with these photographs of Mars, and you know I've done quite a bit of flying, not as a I'm certainly not a pilot, but um, you know when you look at these photographs, these more recent ones of Mars, even I sat here and I went, oh my God, it's like I'm looking down at a damn city, like a city. It just it looks like a city from the air. And buildings everywhere, square shapes that don't make any sense on Mars, uh, from pictures that were imaged just below the surface. I don't know if you've seen those or not. Have you? Uh, which ones are we talking about? Um, they're fairly, within the year, recent pictures that, that were imaged uh, kind of just below the ground, you know, with some of the ground. Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. yeah. My God, well, there's they ones look that are above like... ground that, uh, that are equally fascinating. They and, are. You know, we run into the same thing with... Richard, as we run in with UFO people, is everyone he believes their own research, but when they hear another story, oh, that guy's full of BS. And uh, so you kind of have to do your your own as you as you research this. Now, the last thing I came across is: Have you seen the city of Tithonia? Yes. Okay, that's huh. fascinating. I called up the guy at Project Red Star and I said, "Send me that stuff." And what's so fascinating about it is. I don't know whether you can do it today, but you used to be able to go to Balanced Space Systems, download the, the film yourself, and look at it yourself. You didn't have to go and buy a CD. Yeah, it's incredible stuff. I mean, it, it, from the air, it, to me, uh, it looks very city-like, uh, John. That would imply a, a gigantic civilization that at least at once, at one time, you know, was on, was on Mars, without question. Yeah, and when uh, Bob was working at the test site, one of the things he saw was uh, close-up views of Sidonia. They were taken at very close range. He said that uh, the, the pyramids at Sidonia, he could see doors and windows, and, and, you know, there was no doubt that it was, you know, the place where somebody lived. And so he and I had occasion to drive down to L.A. to pick up his uh, jet car. And when we were down there, we drove over to JPL, and we went to see the guy who was head of... Uh, the, uh, is it, was it Voyager that went? I lost my memory. Who? What were the? What was the? Was it Voyager two that went to Mars? Well, it was Voyager. It was a Voyager. Voyager. Two. Okay. So we went in to see this guy who was head of Voyager Imaging, and we said, you know, Bob has been up to, um, you know, Area fifty one and and seen these close up photos, but you know, in the photos that are released to the public, um, we don't see this particular photo. We said. This photo that he saw was taken at a very low altitude uh, and a, a, a specific angle. We said, did, was Voyager tasked to ever go lower and take pictures? And the guy said, yes, as a matter of fact, we did task it to go lower, but we didn't make any pictures. <laughs> now, here's the beauty of this thing, and this is how a cover-up works. He knew that it went lower, but they, he didn't have an high enough clearance, even though he was head of imaging, that that picture was taken. 
uh, John, why do you think uh, that all of this is being withheld from us, the, the, the whole thing? Why? Why, is why are we being protected from this information? I mean... On the one hand, you you know people call and say, "Oh, look, I could take it." You know the, the fact that Brookings was there and said people would be disturbed and all the rest of it. Baloney! I could, I want to know. So the question is, why are we not being allowed to know? Why why keep it all secret? The answer to that is in the form of, I'd like to to do something with you, but we need a we need a good ten or fifteen minutes because. What I'm going to do is say, Art Bell, the government has chosen you because of your uh, vast uh, experience with the public and what you think they can handle. And we've decided that uh, we are going to either release all this information or not. But what we're going to do is tell you everything that we know, and then you you decide... Yay or nay? Yeah. And, and this Art Bell, it will be you. Now, uh, I would think I would be uh, getting set up, John. Really? Big time. Set up okay. big time. Okay. When, yeah. when we have 10 minutes of clear time, I've written the briefing that you're going to get from the government. And then after that briefing, uh-huh. it comes with slides and videos. Of course, you won't be able to see them, but I'll talk you through them. And then at the end, I'll say, <laughs> Art. Yay or nay. So you're going to give me a briefing, huh? Right. Okay, we'll do that in a few minutes. Uh, uh, Apollo 17. Apollo 17. Uh, or will that... Can, can you give us a brief... I, I mean, was there some mission with regard to Apollo 17 not fully public? Yes. Uh, Apollo 17 uh, landed uh, in the taurus Litro area, which is extremely dangerous. There's uh, mountain peaks that go between eight ten thousand 10,000 feet around the area. But what they were tasked to do on the second day was go to Nansen. And Nansen uh, is a large, uh, obviously constructed opening inside the South Massive, and they wanted to take a look at it. And uh, so essentially that's been covered up, but there's a website where you can read the whole thing, see the pictures of Nansen, uh, you get the exact what the astronauts said, and which is very, very interesting what they said. Uh, and uh, what I'll do at the end of this broadcast, I'm going to email you about ten or fifteen websites that we're talking about, and then you can pass them on to what you like, and they can look at this Apollo 17 and Project Red Star and all the rest of them. All of this, uh, an Apollo mission, uh, our space program in general, how much would have to be hidden? Now, of course, uh, it is worth mentioning that we have not gone back to the moon, uh, not with men, as one would have expected uh, by now, uh, or Mars, or anything else. It's like, it's kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's like we're being kept home. Right, we were told to stay away. And uh, we were given that uh, edict by the aliens. They said, you will not come back here. And, our, and, I, and I'm not sure which, which uh, particular Apollo series it was. It says, well, look, we've got these Saturn prizes. It's going to be hard to yeah. tell the public. And they said, well, okay, run one or two more, and that's it. And Apollo 17 was the last one. And the excuse that NASA gave was, well, we don't have any more funding. We can't do it. And they have you know, the three remaining Saturn Vs fueled, ready to go, and they were 18, 19, and 20. This threat that stopped us, John, um, it, what was the or else part? It was just or else, and, you know, since I didn't know exactly what they said, and I haven't talked to anybody who um, who heard the threat, it was just enough of a threat that, you know, we don't come back here. You're not welcome. Yeah, got it. All right, stay put. You know, it's it's kind of interesting. Over the years of doing this program, so many years now, I've often wondered why I've been allowed to do it at all. <laughs> so, uh, okay, let's say the government chose me. Uh, they were going to use me as an outlet to release this information. Let's just say they did that and they took me to a briefing. Then what, John? Okay, we whisk you to, or they whisk you to <clears throat> Washington, D.C. You get limoed to this building, beautiful building. You go up into this room. Uh, they 
say, Art, you're the guy. Um, if you give us the go-ahead, we're going to release everything we know to the public. And if you decide to go ahead, all major networks will be provided with information on all aspects of the cover-up. No type of information will be withheld because of the deal for immunity for all participants of the cover-up provides that nothing, no artifact, no piece of information be withheld. So here's what happened, Art. Uh, and, of course, this will call, uh, uh, we'll use some videos and stills. Our first UFO recoveries are in the late 30s. We made a couple in the beginning of the 40s, and then came Roswell, which the public found out about. We got two live aliens from Roswell. One died shortly thereafter. One lived until 1956. And we found out that so far there are 18 different alien species that we know about monitoring Earth. Some are good, some are hostile. Most are indifferent. Uh, we found out that we are the experiment or product, if you will, of an alien race who we never met and really don't know who they are. All we know is that the greys are cybernetic organisms, glorified robots, if you will, who work here at the behest of their employers, monitoring us through abductions. Uh, we were never able to find out what the experiment is all about, except that we have been externally corrected about 65 times, and they, the aliens, refer to us as containers. There has been speculation that the souls our bodies contains is the reason for the experiment, but nothing has been proven or determined. Since 1938, we have lost over 200 aircraft to UFO hostilities and thousands of soldiers in all kinds of different kinds of action with aliens. Since that time, several hundred thousand civilians have disappeared with no trace. And several thousand were eliminated by us because of their chance encounters with aliens, which we could ill afford to have publicized. A slightly more frightening phenomenon known as human mutilations have occurred on a regular basis and are similar to the cattle mutilations in that the humans or humans are taken from the street, so to speak, and returned to the same area about 45 minutes to an hour later with their rectums cored out, their genitals removed, their eyes removed from their sockets, and completely drained of blood. In all cases, it appears that the mutilation procedures occurred while the persons were still alive and conscious. One of our scientists speculate that apparently the human specimens had to be alive for the samples to be worth anything. Abductions occur on a daily basis throughout the United States to at least 10% of the population. And when we first became aware of this, we protested to the little gray being that we held in the captivity at the YY2, uh, YY-2 facility at Los Alamos. But a deal was struck that in exchange for advanced technology from the aliens, we would allow them to abduct a very small number of persons, and we would be periodically given a list of those persons abducted. We got something less than the technology we bargained for and found that the abductions exceeded by a million-fold what we had naively agreed to. In 1954, President Eisenhower met with a representative of another alien species at Miroc Test Center, which is now called Edwards Air Force Base. This alien suggested that they could help us get rid of the greys, but Eisenhower turned down their offer because they offered no technology. At this, at this point, it became apparent to all involved that there was no such thing as a god, at least as the public perceives god. Certainly some kind of computer recorder stores information, and an occasional miracle is displayed by the aliens to influence a religious event. So this, this so unnerved Eisenhower that he had, in God we trust, put on paper money and coins and put into the Pledge of Allegiance to reaffirm the public belief in God. Shortly after this, it was determined at meetings between the U.S. and Russians that the situation was serious enough that a Cold War should be manufactured as a ruse to divert attention of the public away from UFOs and towards some other scary threat, the H-bomb. Wow. It was also decided to keep the ruse secret from any elected or appointed official within both the U.S. and Russian government as long as, uh, as it took so long to vet these uh, officials and the ruse was easier to manage if the top people didn't know about it. In the late 1950s, NASA was formed to compartmentalize, containerize, and sanitize information from all space platforms and vehicles. We sold NASA to the public, claiming that all information would belong to them. Actually, they got very little, and even that was highly sanitized. Our first efforts were to keep the public from learning about Venus, uh, and that it's a similar planet to Earth, and that its population is very similar to us, but more technologically advanced. Uh, we have learned a lot from them. Starting with the Russian Venera 1 and U.S. Mariner 2, we made Venus look like a lead-melting, volcanic surface spewing sulfuric acid 
into a pressurized atmosphere 90 times that of Earth. And it was often the case we overdid it and wondered why no one ever asked how a parachute survived a descent into 800-degree air. We set up operations in Pine Gap, Australia, to preclude any prying eyes trying to figure out what we were up to. We regularly eliminated, through extreme prejudice, anybody who was part of the operation and made the least little tiny threat about disclosure or satisfaction with the operation. Any space mission that included Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, Mariner, Voyager, Clementine, and all the rest, all data initially came transmitted to Pine Gap, and then it was relayed to JPL or wherever uh, after the sanitizing. We had a little trouble with amateur radio operators, uh, but we figured out when they figured out how they could intercept these signals, but we managed to deal with that. When the Russian threat began to fade, we introduced Vietnam, which kept the public occupied for over 10 years. The cover-up and the personnel to run the operation began to get bigger and bigger and required more and more money. We were enforced to inflate the defense budget, which soon was not enough. Then we got into the drug business, which was still not enough. We were the ones that looted the savings and loan industry and Wall Street to boot. It is so out of control now, most people want immunity and want out. There, but there is so much secrecy and so many double and triple blinds in place that it is unlikely that this thing can ever be dismantled. And even if you give us the go-ahead to spill the beans to the public, it's unlikely they will get anything more than, yes, we recovered a flying saucer, and yes, there was an occupant, but that's all we're going to tell you. So go ahead and roll the tape for Mr. Bell. Uh, what you see here are, are the human mutilations uh, look like. That one was a male about 27 years old. Uh, now that film is of dead aliens being pulled from the wreckage of their craft that crashed in Atlanta, California in the 50s. That craft you see over there is uh, was over 250 feet in diameter and had to be buried on the spot. Uh, that site is in Utah near Dugway Proving Grounds. The object that you're looking at now is the Kecksburg Acorn, which was brought to Wright Pat in the middle 60s. There's Frank Drake trying to force information out of a being tied down to that stretcher. He was supposedly from Tau Ceti. These pictures you're looking at now are the structures on the moon. That's the tower in Sinus Medi. It's over seven miles t uh, tall. And that thing there is what we call the Colossus of Agurum in Mary Cassiam. We don't know what it does, but the machine itself is bigger than Brooklyn, New York. Now, those are videos of the domes covering the craters. You can see that some are in a very advanced state of decay. Now, these are five-second slides of the 18 different alien species we are looking uh, at. That one there is the most gruesome looking. The guards at one facility are carefully indoctrinated over a period of several months, being shown pictures similar to, but not exactly like the alien. Only when they have been acclimatized, so to speak, of the horrible looking beings, are they allowed to stand uh, in security positions. Before these acclimatations were done, we had two guards die of a heart attack as these aliens came down the hallway unexpectedly. And this last clip is of the Kennedy assassination. You've heard of the second gunman theory. Well, this is the second camera that recorded exactly what happened. We had four gunmen. And the bottom line was Kennedy had to go. He insisted on releasing what little alien information we had told him about and he was trying to withdraw troops from Vietnam, which we were using as a diversion for the public. After the Kennedy, we never told any president anything. Nixon knew because he was briefed as VP in 1952. That's how he knew where to take Jackie Gleason to Homestead Air Force Base to see the alien bodies we had storage there. And that's about it. What say uh, you, Art Bell? I Can we brief the public, yay or nay? My, my first response would be, uh, having heard even just a quarter of that information, if I really heard it from a legitimate government source, that I was about to be killed. I would assume I would be in mortal danger. Uh, I mean, it's just... Uh, <laughs> any, any portion uh, of that information uh, would get a person killed if they... If they knew it, much less. Uh, uh, I, it's just ludicrous, John. I would never be put in such a situation. I would never be at such a briefing because such a briefing is never and will never be made ever. Okay. Ever. Well, well, Art. Here's the deal: is people want to know. I. They say I can take it. Tell me. I mean, the public can take it. Well, they they can't. I I agree. Okay. With now the, wait a minute. Are you saying let's release it or not? You've been given this briefing. The government has decided, look, 
We're tired of covering this thing up. This Here's assumes that I really believe they would release it as opposed to killing me. No, <laughs> right? no they wouldn't kill you if they were giving you a briefing. They just say, here it is. Right? No, I mean, once I said no, uh, yes or no, uh, well, I suppose no. Once I said no, then I'd have to be killed, wouldn't no, I? Because, no, because no. other people have been killed. That was part of your briefing. Yeah, but uh, they quit that in 1972. Up until 1972, there was 572 people eliminated from the program because they they disagreed with the way it was going. But after that, they don't kill them anymore. What they do, I don't know. Uh, I have, you know, suspicions of what they do. But why do you imagine? Don't bring that into the argument. Why do you imagine they let people like you on radio shows like this and saying these things? The government, the the. The cover-up is so firmly in place now that it's not a threat to them. Doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, who, how many people are we talking? It doesn't matter. People listen to it and think it's interesting and go on their business. Well, that's that true. My point is that if you knew the whole story, you wouldn't be pushing for disclosure. No, I wouldn't. I uh, of course I would not. I I believe that Brookings was accurate. In fact, I believe e even more than that. I've spent all these years getting emails from talking to people in the Bible Belt. John, I talked to a lot of them. I know how the fundamentalists feel and it would it would turn us upside down. Okay, I agree with you. Now, last night I talked with the guy who's heading up the disclosure project in Washington, D.C., and I read him the exact same thing I did to you, and he said, yeah, go for it, let's do it. Uh, you know, you have a right to know. And I'm wondering, yeah. you know, how could you possibly think like that? Um, yeah, how, how can he? Um, I, I've, I've asked the same questions, uh, really, I have. And you get a, a wonderful speech in return that also makes sense, you know, and you get the patriotic angle, you get the... You know, we're, we're part of all that's happening, and we really do have a right to know about these profound issues. They're so profound that we have a right to know, and the argument sounds good. It really does sound good, but I also know what would happen if this information Okay, became... you're 100% right, and that's how I believe. Uh, and they bring up the argument, well, I'm tired of the government lying to us. Well, that's what governments do. That's what they're for. I mean, they lie to us continually, but on this particular issue, they're correct. Uh, you you pretty firmly believe that what you just laid out there, as it's a, it was a litany of horrors, to be sure, uh, is pretty much accurate, John? You really well, think I didn't put all the bad stuff in there, but you know, <laughs> that, <laughs> no, uh, that that's essentially what it is. I thought you were going over the top a little with the human mutilations and right. It's a fact. I mean, it happened. I'm. I hear these dark, quiet. Don't quote me, but there have been these things going on. Type conversations. People that I deal with who really do know what is going on have talked um, very quietly, John, about human mutilations. It's just kind of at almost at the whisper in your ear stage regarding human mutilations. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, there's no way that the government, suppose they were trying to be forced to, to make a release, is to say, you know, okay, yeah, we, we, did, we do have something from Roswell, and there was an alien, but that's all we're going to tell you. Well, I call it the Pandora's box syndrome. You can't open it a little bit. A little, yeah. yeah. And that's why the government is so, is ready to risk I mean, supreme ridicule, you know, even though one, you know, lands in the middle of the city, uh, no, it doesn't exist, because they can't open the box even a little bit. Here's something I'm curious about, John. Uh, you saw the recent headlines about the Chinese. How are we going to stop the Chinese from going to the moon? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know either. Uh, we might have over, you know, a lot of control over a great deal of the uh, the rest of the world. But I'm fairly certain we don't have much control over the Chinese. And, boy, they're just really getting into space. Uh, they just announced they're going to be sending a probe to the moon. Now, I wonder how cooperative the Chinese are, say, versus the Russians. 
Boy, I'm glad that's not my problem. <laughs> Uh, because at some point, uh, the Chinese are going to be looking at things that, uh, that, that I guess we don't want them looking at. Um, or, or, or do you suppose that at the very, very highest, uh, in other words, you've got to imagine, I, I guess you firmly believe, don't you, John, that there is a fully operational, what kind of government, John? How does it work, do you suppose? Any, any idea how our, elected, in quotes, government, uh, in effect, takes its instruction from... I don't know, but my favorite story about the secret government is, remember Dick D'Amato? Do you remember that name? Yes. Okay, Dick was the uh, aide, arrogant as he was, to, I think, uh, Senator Byrd. And Dick had every compartmentalized clearance you could get. And he, you know, he was you know, uh, the point man for the Senate Armed Services Committee, and he's the one that doled out the money to the guys at Groom Lake, and, and he thought he knew everything. And then all of a sudden this stuff comes on TV. Lazar works on extraterrestrial craft and stuff going on at Tonopah. And, yep. and so he comes to Las Vegas, and he sits down and talks with George Knapp and, and uh, John Andrews and, and a few of us. I wasn't at the meeting, and makes the statement, Look, there better not ever, there better not be anything going on at Tonopah right now because that place, as far as we are concerned, is closed. There's nothing in the budget. Uh-huh. Well, he goes up to Groom Lake and, uh, and supposedly gets a tour. And, and the funny thing was, it, it, it was snowing that day. Uh, I remember it was a Monday. <clears throat> and, uh, I wonder, I said, you know, I thought to myself, I wonder where, you know, he's going to go. And so, you know, he came back, and the question was, well, what would you see? He said, anything I want. Well, where'd you go? Anywhere, I, you know, I wanted. Really? Well, the thing is, you know, how's he going to know where Papoose Lake is, and how's he going to find this? I mean, he wouldn't know Papoose Lake from Lake Tahoe. But the funny thing is, here, you know, he knew that Tonopah, Tonopah Test Range was supposed to be closed, and here my friends at American Trans Air were flying in six times a day. So that night I called up uh, one of the captains. I said, hey, what's the deal? Did you guys make any flights today? And they said, no, Air Force called this morning and shut everything down. And that was because just in case D'Amato wanted to go to test Tonopah, he'd find nothing there. Wow, really? So here's a guy that had all the clearances, everything, and, you know, they weren't good. The guys that, uh, you know, run this thing weren't going to give him the time of day. Hold it. Hold it right there. Let me read a little of what I read earlier. During the 1980s, John tracked down and found the Army intelligence analyst who read and, uh, as in fact says, probably by accident, the U.S. government report Grudge 13, which documented the history of the UFO cover-up and details, you know, the whole thing, the uh, the, the saucers, uh, the occupants, all of it. John, um, that was during a time that you were sort of consumed by all of this. How did you come to track this man down? I read the report that he wrote. His name was Bill English. And it was, it was so real uh, what he wrote about uh, exactly how he opened the document, how it was given to him, what was in it, and so thorough that I wanted to meet the guy, so yeah, there was no way to find him. It turns out that I found out his father was a state senator in Arizona. I wrote to his father and uh, several times, never heard any answer. Then one night I get a call, and it says, and the guy says, uh, my understanding is you want to meet with Bill English. Can I ask you why? And I told him why. Hmm. And he said, uh, let me call you later. So... I got a call later, and the guy says, if you want to meet Bill English, you have to go to such and such airport at such and such time. And it was in West Virginia, I think, uh, and uh, sit in such and such bench uh, and such and such, such state. So I arranged to be there. Oh, brother. And I sat in his bench. And I got to tell you, you know, there were some, there were some, you know, it was a little teeny airport, and here's some guys in, you know, three-piece suits walking around. Now, what they were there for, I don't know. <laughs> but a guy came over and sat on the other end of the bench, uh, a great big guy in a, you know, in Western clothing and, and a big jacket. It was cold outside. And he looked over and said, uh, would you like to have a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. Uh-huh. 
So we went out, got into his car, and drove to a place, and he introduced himself as Bill English. And uh, end up, I stayed, he, he lived in a trailer on a pig farm, and he was essentially in hiding. He knew he had done, you know, something that the government didn't want, and I interviewed him for that those two days and satisfied myself that, indeed, he had, you know... How, how did he come upon this report? He was in a, uh, um, let's see if I can, you know, I have the, I have the report here. He was in, uh, uh, assigned to the RAF listening post north of London uh -huh. uh, as an information analyst. And in the course of his duties, he was asked to prepare an analysis of the elusive grudge, of the elusive grudge 13 report. Um, he says he doesn't know why he was given it. Uh, he said, uh, that afterwards he was uh, discharged and sent to the United States. And um, there's no reason why he was given this sensitive report. Now, a little background on Grudge. <laughs> after Blue Book uh, they, after Blue Book was closed, they started the Grudge reports. And Grudge, uh, there was 14 reports, number 1 through 12, and number 14 was re released to the public. And they were essentially, you know, UFO reports and... and uh, you know, nothing very interesting. Mm -hmm. And everybody wondered where Grudge 13 went and the government's position was it was an unlucky number and no Grudge report was assigned that number. But in fact, the real information was in Grudge 13. Uh, I don't have any reason as to why he was given that report, but he reported thoroughly on it, uh, wrote a thing that I read, and uh, then I went and interviewed him. And uh, it was very interesting, a very interesting time. Uh, you know, the guy really had a lot of problems. They could, couldn't find a job. The last time I saw him was in Sunspot, New Mexico. He lived there, in a, you know, with his family in a real dilapidated apartment. And, of course, at that time I didn't have that much money myself, and I couldn't help him very much. And that, that was, let's see, 1988, So, and I haven't heard from him since then. Hmm. But most of these guys like that, uh, whoever talked to me disappear. For instance, the guy that was the photographer uh, in the Air Force in Hawaii, and he was assigned TDY to San Bernardino, Norton Air Force Base. And uh, he gets to Norton, and um, he's picked up in a limo with blacked out, and he was with one other photographer, and they picked up with a limo, uh, limo with blacked out windows, and they head north. And... Uh, it was a black limo driver, and the black limo driver, about an hour into the drive, looked back and said, so you boys going to see the flying saucers, huh? And, you know, they had no idea. I mean, they were, you know, that wasn't part of their information or anything. So they drive close to 29 Palms, uh, the, the Marine Station there, and uh, the driver drives onto this platform, and it's lowered inside this huge hangar. And... They get out of the car, and they're asked to go into this little um, cubicle where they're asked to uh, strip off all their clothing, clothing and get into a smock and booties and a hat. Mm. And then they're given a camera, and in the, in the middle of this hangar, in a net, was a UFO, a flying saucer, about 30 feet in diameter. And there was a ladder leading up to the hatch. Uh, so he climbs up into it uh, with the camera behind him, and he leans into the hatch, and he said to me, he said, John, he said it was so shocking, it was so huge in there that I could have taken a football and thrown it as far as I could, and it wouldn't have hit the other side. And he said, I backed out to see how big this thing was, and it was only 30 feet. And he said, I you know, <laughs> crawled back in, and there was uh, some scientists standing there, and they told me what to take pictures of. And, you know, I took those pictures and uh, eventually went back, changed the clothing, got to the airport and sent back to Hawaii. And he disappeared. And he I never disappeared. heard from him after he sat in, in the same room that I'm talking to you from and told me that story and never heard from him again. Odd. Uh, from David in Portland, an interesting question, one that I would have made it to anyway, but um, please ask... Uh, uh, John, if Lazar ever mentioned the word containers to him, Lazar, 
uh, read about containers in the uh, briefing papers, so the military knows about this as well. Containers, ask about the containers. This means everything. And uh, I guess maybe it does. What is the question? Uh, well, whether Bob Lazar had ever mentioned that word, containers, to you. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, he's the, the 65 external corrections and that the aliens referred to us as containers, and that was in the briefing. Now, remember, when he went to work there, every day he would be taken into this room, and he said there was, you know, a 100 or so briefings in in small packets, small, you know, each one was stapled, and uh, and it had, you know, maybe uh, 10 or 15 pages, and a number of pages would be stapled together at the back. In other words, his clearance hadn't progressed to the point where he could read the whole briefing, but he could read a little bit of it. Well, this must be the the core, or might be the core issue that drives everything. That is, who we are. I mean, all of these different alien uh, races interested in us. Now, you know, we're something, but we're. It doesn't seem like we're that much, uh, unless, unless, um, unless we have, unless our souls have value. Well, if I haven't made it clear, um, we are an experiment. We're their experiment. And it's been going on for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and the experiment is with the soul. Uh, well, we're, we are with... there. We're, we're their experiment, but yet we have, uh, we, we have souls. I don't know, John. I... Uh, the souls, the souls are real. They go on forever and ever. They're recycled. You have many, many, many past lifetimes, but for some reason, we're not allowed to remember those. Uh, we can't profit from, um, you know, previous lifetimes. Now, every once in a while, there's a short circuit, and people do remember very clearly lifetimes that happened 500 years it, ago. Yes. They can go back to England. Yes. They can trace names. They can give you names, people in the cemetery, who they were there, you know, the whole, whole thing. So there, there's no doubt about the soul goes on, you know, forever and ever. But there. it must be at the core of, of all the interest. I mean, the big question is, why are they so damn interested in us that they would dissect us, mutilate us? Oh, no, wait a minute. Dad, don't confuse the dissecting and mutilating with the people who are doing the experiment. That's somebody else. Well, uh, you know, you say the people doing the experiment. Uh, what about the word God? I mean, are they, <laughs> if they created us, if we are their experiment, then to, uh, to us they would be our God. Absolutely. Very disturbing concept. Uh, or do you do you hold out that there would be, I mean, you said absolutely. Do you hold out there would be a God separate from? No, no that's opinion. No, there is, there's, there's not anybody else. There's just, there's just them. Now, I'm going to get a lot of flack over that, but yep. in fact, you know, that's the story. Well, that's the story that never can be told, right? That's right, <laughs> and that's why they can't let the little, the first thing out. Because it's all going to lead up to that. Did you, at some point, um, I don't know, ten years ago, get completely satisfied? Did you like sit down at your desk one day and say, "Okay, for John Lear, I know as much as I need to know now. I'm satiated. Book closed." That was part of it, and part of it was the continual and. Uh, there's a word for it, uh, Harass very harassment. subtle, <laughs> very subtle harassment, very subtle. Nothing you could put your finger on, but, you know, nothing went right. And then when I quit talking about it, you know, things improved, got a job, you know, and as long as I kept my mouth shut, everything was fine. And now you just don't have that... Uh... And then Art Bell calls. That, so, that risk. <laughs> oh, do you think that risk is still there? I mean, yes, you're retired, and you don't have a job to lose at the moment, but, hey, there are other aspects of your life. Uh, do you, are you at all concerned that they will not like this? They will not like it, but it's a one-time shot. I want to do, you know, I want to discuss this thing about disclosure and why I don't think it's the right thing. And, uh, you know, it's opinion only. 
and uh, I think if I leave it at that, that's fine. I well, if it, I mean, if what we just discussed, if if in fact we perhaps rightly ought to be thinking of them as God in in the sense of the word, I guess, of our creators. Uh, no, 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 no. Don't don't confuse that. They want us to think of God and Jesus and Mary and all uh-huh. that in the context. That they, you know, they they made all that. They made the religion. They gave us the Ten Commandments, all that, uh, merely so that we wouldn't hurt ourselves while the experiment is going on. But as soon as we figure out that it's them, then the experiment, you know, for all I know, maybe maybe over uh, <laughs> terminated. Well, yeah, they might decide to clean out the petri dish and say, well, boy, you know, that was a mistake. Let's let's do another one. <laughs> I wonder if they consider us in that manner uh, as a mistake. Any any clues as to how the experiment is going? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Huh? I I look at uh, the environment, and maybe I'm, the picture isn't big enough, but you know I see G the North Pole melting, uh, the Antarctic melting, all these really weird things going on right now in our environment, and. That would seem to be a real trouble spot for us. But again, I may not be looking at a big enough picture. I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, does that, does that give us a failing grade? Is there some greater thing that we are to attain for them? I wonder what the nature of the experiment is, John. I wouldn't even no, huh? to know to, to know what the experiment was about. And the reason is because every time you learn something new, the first thing the guy who's going to tell it is, well, to know uh, to to understand this, first you have to know about so and so. Do you know about so and so? No. Mm-hmm. So then they have to explain such and such. So since I don't know such and such, I can't possibly, you know, presume to know what the experiment is about. Do you understand? Yes. Okay. I do. Uh... But I, I do, that is something I do want to know. I mean, if, it, if all the rest of this is true, then I want to understand w- what we're living. I guess we all want to understand that. Um, obviously, the information that uh, they set up God and Jesus and all of that for us to control the experiment. Exactly. <laughs> now you've got it. That's... Uh, that's that's a total killer. I mean, information of that sort would, I think, destroy the world as Probably. we know it. It certainly would destroy the world as we know it. Yeah. And and then so were these other religions. I mean, was was all of man's religion, Buddha, all the rest of it. Uh, Buddhism and I can only say probably because the only thing that uh, 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 Bob read in the document is the aliens and Jesus and two others, and he and he told the names, and and uh, I can't remember what the names were. Um, they well, were associated with other religions, though. Let me give you this to chew on. I interview a really bright guy who annoys the hell out of my audience when I have him on. His name is Matthew Alper. And uh, it is his contention, John, that we are wired to worship, wired to worship, that there is uh, some aspect of the human brain. And sure enough, you know, you can go find some tribe that hasn't been touched by man, and they worship something, the sun, uh, the moon, uh, the wind, uh, whatever. They worship something, in some cases making sacrifices. Uh, In other words, everybody is wired to grasp this belief that uh, we, we cannot deal with the concept of mortality, and so the brain, in its own defense, is wired to worship. And he takes a lot of flack for that. But doesn't that kind of make sense with what you just said uh, about um, our creators and the uh, experiment and all the rest uh, wired to worship i would agree that we're wired but we certainly have to i mean we have to hold on to something yes yes we have to hold on to something well if you were our creators and you were setting up the experiment you might um, wire your experiment to have religious to tend toward 
having to have religious belief yeah, uh, for the whole control thing. It's a possibility. One of the interesting things that Bob read in the documents is of the three that were sent down for these religious, you know, various religions, one was killed. And he said he read 18 pages of the search that the aliens made to find him. And throughout the 18 pages, it was fraught with the idea that they couldn't believe that mankind had destroyed this individual that they spent so much time hmm. making. Hmm. Uh, huh. Well, that's a, you've given me and everybody an awful lot to try and digest. Um, I guess it's your contention that this is so indigestible for most people that they'll treat it as, uh, you know, just so far beyond belief <laughs> that that's why the cover-up's in no danger, just because it's so far out and because people's uh, faith Absolutely. and religion will cause them to just reject it. The bottom line is, you know, as, as irritating is, it's none of their business. <laughs> none of their business. Um, but but on the other hand, for some of us, like you, for example, it is uh, your business, or you've made it your business. I used to. Now I'm content to go to my cabin at Gold Butte where there is not a single human being for 60 miles and just sit there uh, and enjoy the uh, the mountainside and the animals and, and everything. It's, just, it's, it's really nice. I remember you telling people at one point just exactly that, you know, just uh, sort of dismiss this stuff that we've been talking about and go enjoy your life. Something like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, never fear. You will get an opportunity in the final hour tonight to speak with John Lear. Uh, Paula, Paula in Kansas City, Missouri, writes, Hey, Art, John's hypothetical briefing was a trial balloon of the real briefing. Your answer should be yes. It's about time we all face the truth together. People will still believe in an overall God as the creator of the universe. Religions will adapt. Uh, what do you think about that, John? Religions a, will adapt. It surprises me because uh, I talked to uh, Steve Bassett last night in the Disclosure Project. And oh, yes. He said the same thing. He said, hey, let's go for it. Let's tell them. And I wouldn't. I mean, if it, my, my decision, I wouldn't. There's too many scary things. I mean, you know, we've got enough problems with, with, with everything going on that we don't need to inject one more, regardless of whether the government's been lying to us all these years. Wow. Um, well, John, it's been, it has been 10 years, and so there are probably things that you, in fact, I know there's lots of things that you've never talked about, you've never been able to talk about. Are there any more things you're able to talk about today than you were, say, 10 years ago? Uh, not that I can think right off. I, I can't think of anything. Well, you hit us with 911. That, that uh, surprised me. But, I mean, I, surely, uh, uh, in other words, the things that you couldn't talk about 10 years ago, which were quite a few, I mean, I hit a few brick walls with you, there are still brick walls. Well, refresh my memory. Huh. Um. Well, uh, let's see. You're going to test me. I, I do remember there were brick walls, and now you're calling me to task. What were they? Um, well, I don't know if I ever asked you about what people are calling chemtrails, but since you're a commercial pilot, that would be a cool question. You know, I don't know too much about that, and I didn't follow it closely. The one thing that I did read was that apparently somebody found something uh, the FAA found something at Boeing in Seattle in the production line of the 737, and there was going to be an investigation of what in the world all that stuff was that was not conforming to the drawings, and uh, you no know, reason why it was there, and I didn't hear a thing after that. Now, well, you would know a lot more about contrails than the average person, being a commercial pilot, probably somehow or another. You'd know a lot about contrails, and. Uh, has there been, in recent years, 
uh, something in contrails that is abnormal, that's different? Uh, well, you know, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on the people who study the contrails, but, you know, contrails are contrails. There's yep. so many airplanes in the sky that, you know, I don't see anything. And I've looked at a lot of these crisscrossing contrails, and I think, well, you know, maybe, but, uh, you know, I just, it, it didn't become a part of, of uh, my interest. Uh huh. So, you know, there were certain um, attributes uh, that were said to accompany some of these things that uh, might be seen as contrails, but really contained uh, different chemicals. And, and one can imagine, I mean, after all, our climate is going berserk right now. It may be that somebody in our government recognizes that fact. There have been various theories. One is uh, climate modification of some sort. Another would be um, mass inoculations in view of terrorist threats or something like that. Uh, and, and after all, there is, there is a history of our government having conducted experiments on its own people. There's a long, rich history of that, John. Right. So, um, but, but you never really specifically paid enough attention to suggest they, there might be more to some contrails than would appear to be the case. No, I'm not saying that, that they couldn't be. It's just that, you know, I don't, you know, it's, it's not in my interest. Here's another, here's another person who objects, and, and uh, Larry in, up in Canada says, you know, if it could be proven 100% for sure, no doubt that there's no eternity, that this is it. Uh, do you think everybody would suddenly go out and begin to kill that nasty neighbor or idiot co-worker? A uh, serious question we're thinking about. Um, okay, what do you mean by this is it? Well, that this is it, that that this life uh, is, is all there is. Of course, you're not saying that. Um, I think he, he read something into what we were saying, and I understand you're not saying that. You're, you are acknowledging we have an eternal soul, or Absolutely. a soul at any rate. And um, so, I guess... That question's really, uh, in, a, in a way, up in smoke. Uh, but uh, even if, if all that you've laid out for us in that briefing were known, I guess uh, a question would be, would suddenly uh, people go nuts to the point that they'd go out and kill or riot or whatever? Some people are saying no, they wouldn't. I mean, that people would continue to behave basically the, w the way they behave every day. Possibly. But I'm not going to take the chance, are you? Uh, well, no. I gave you my answer, and I, I really have carefully considered, uh, not with that much inform as much information as you laid on the table, but I've, I've carefully considered it, and, and having talked to so many fundamentalists, maybe my opinion is skewed for that reason, but I know the passion of these beliefs and, and how such information would be greeted and dealt with by uh, enough of a minority. They could, I mean, you know, Countries are overthrown by small percentages of people. So, yeah, my answer is no. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't release the information. Um, John, are you going to do anything else? Are you going to, now that you've got time in your hands, you're retired, you could start digging again. Or, or are, you, are you sort of saying... There is no point in digging anymore because I know as much as I need or even want to know. Yeah, um, I'm satisfied. That doesn't mean there isn't a huge volume of more information. It's that I am personally satisfied. <clears throat> I am personally satisfied, satisfied to go up and sit in my cabin and and uh, spend yeah. the rest of my life looking at the deer and the quail and and uh, getting the gold mining operation going. It, this is, you know, this is. Uh, I'm satisfied. You know, I know listen, as much as I need to know. That doesn't mean there isn't a bond. I understand. All right, let's talk about gold for a second. Um, you know the name Sitchin, of course. Sure. Well, Zachariah has been on the show oh a number of times, and I know his story really well uh, with regard to what he believes our history is, which was that we were created early on as gold miners. And I don't know why it's such a crazy story, you know, with the planet that comes zooming by every now and then, and um, that we were created for this gold mining purpose. But I do know that humans have an unnatural 
attraction to gold. You can hold gold in your hand, and you can feel, I don't know, <laughs> John, well, I don't know, and there's something special when you hold a piece of gold in your hand. Yeah, William Bramley came up with the same um, same idea in The Gods of Eden, uh, where he hypothesized that we're, we were being bred as slaves. Uh-huh. That doesn't mean slaves to dig gold, but it, that was part of the uh, hypothesis. Um, there is something special about gold, John. I, I I don't know what, but maybe as a gold miner you can comment on that. If, do you feel it when you hold gold? Is there something abnormally special about it? Well, of course, my gold is is a load, and uh, you know it passes. All we're doing is passing it across the table once, and we get a concentrate, and we take that somewhere else to get them doing the refining. So actually, I don't get to feel gold. But in your life, I'm sure you've held some gold in your hand. Yeah, I have that gold bracelet I got in Laos. <laughs> well, there you are. Um, how much uh, work during your career? Yeah, here comes a brick wall. Uh, how much work have you done for the CIA, John? Uh, well, you know, as I said, I flew in Laos, and, um, and then I did that... Um, you know, when you say for the CIA, um, yeah, yeah. everything after Vietnam, when Air America went on strike with the agency, the agency after that went all to, you know, contract carriers. And the story that I'll tell you, the only reason I can tell you is because it's published in a book called Private Warriors by Silverstein, and it was uh, put out two years ago. And uh, it, somehow this guy got the, this, found out the story and got to the, the log books. And, uh, and found out the whole thing. But uh, in 1977, um, Somalia had tr- traditionally been supported by uh, Russia. And uh, Ethiopia, we had traditionally supported them. As a matter of fact, we had a space tracker station there. And um, it came, that, and the Russians had built a uh, deep water port on the Red Sea called Berbera. Well, there was a... Uh, rebels uh, causing a lot of problem in Ethiopia, and Russia sent some people in there to, or sent soldiers into there to support the rebels. Now, this really angered Somalia that the Russian, their ally, would, you know, support their lifelong mortal enemy. So they kicked the Russians out, and at at that time, you know, and still, the name of the game was... uh, uh, property on the Red Sea, because if the Persian Gulf is ever, uh, Straits of Hormuz is ever cut off, then the only way oil can flow is down through the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. So you want to have property there to be sure that that happens. They have big pipelines that go from uh, Saudi Arabia south uh, to the Red Sea, just just for that reason. So we went in there and said, hey, you know, we'll help you. We went in Somalia and said, you know, we'll help you. And uh, so we started uh, started supporting Somalia mainly because we wanted that deep water port in Berbera, uh, which we got. And I was part of uh, the tra- – well, what happened is Somalia now gets to ready to fight Ethiopia again, which they do traditionally, mm-hmm. and they're armed with East Bloc guns, and they don't have any East Bloc ammunition. Same thing with Ethiop- Ethiopia. They don't have any West Bloc. So – uh, ammunition. So there was a high-level trade, or you know, high-level agreement at the, at the highest levels, to send East Bloc ammunition to Somalia, and I was part of that. We flew 707 loads for two or three months from Budapest uh, down. Uh, we refueled in uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and then on down to Somalia and delivered it there. Isn't some of that pretty dangerous stuff? It was dangerous, and you know we were briefed at the beginning. If you if you get into any trouble, if you're forced down, don't call us. Don't call us. No, that's the deal. That's the deal. That's why you, you get all that money. Don't call us. Over the years, John, uh, how aware of um, by air drug and gun running have you been? Um. I don't understand the question. Over the years uh, in the airline industry and piloting, how aware of, how massive, I guess I should say, is it understood that um, drugs and guns are 
regularly uh, smuggled? Oh, all the time. I mean, that's <laughs> it, it, it's different now because, you know, a lot of the, the drugs come from uh, South America, and they have so many ways to get it into the United States that it's just an impossible task to keep it out. Any thoughts on the uh, the war on drugs? As far as? Well, just thoughts on the war on drugs in general. Well. Is this a war we should be even fighting? No, uh, it, it's not worth fighting. I don't know whether I'd go as far as to say legalize it, but, you know, they're up against a, you know, a brick wall. It's it's a it's an extremely big problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, how are they going to solve it? I don't know, if at all. Are you going to do any more flying, John? I may do a little. I, you know, contract out to uh, very 1011s here and there, but at 60, you know, you're limited to what you can do. You can't fly for the airlines anymore. It's uh, mandatory retirement. And um, the airline that I worked for, Kitty Hawk International, went bankrupt in May of 2000. So essentially I've been out of work since then. It was two years until I turned 60. I had one more fling, and I say fling because it was fun. I flew an L-1011 for a Cambodian company that had a contract with Air India to take the Hajis uh, from all over India to Saudi Arabia for the Hajj in 2001, and it was fun. I had a great crew. Uh -huh. uh, if they were great runs, they were you know six to eight hours. Uh, we had good hotels. Uh, there was you know little or no paperwork, and uh, it was fun. I, I enjoyed it. It was the last last plane that I had. Do you really miss it now? No. No, I don't no. miss flying. I don't miss the constant, you know, am I going to bust an altitude? Am I going to, um, I'm trying to think of the word they go, uh, uh, when you make a mistake on an airport, uh, I forget what they call it, but it's a constant battle to be sure you don't screw up. And, you know, I, I did my 40 years. And, I, and I'm glad it's over. Forty years. That's a lot of flying, John. How many miles? Any idea? No. No idea. No <laughs> idea. <laughs> I would think every now and then you'd sit down and think about, well, maybe how, how, how many has it been? How many million or whatever? Um, how do you think uh, people tonight are going to react to a lot of what you've said? I mean, we're going to get to phone lines here shortly. What, what, what do you think the reaction will be like? I really don't know. It's... Uh... You know, I've said a lot of things that, uh -huh. you know, I can back up most of it, and uh, I'm just really surprised that with the information I gave that people say, yeah, hey, let's go for it. I, I want to know the truth, and that surprises me. Oh, you'll hear a lot of them here shortly. Um, it, it, it really does surprise me, too, and if you did what you did to me tonight, and that is put a person actually in that spot receiving that information and saying, what would your decision be? I I don't know. I I just I don't think the average person really could say that, and and yet they are more and more. They're saying, "Come on, let's bust it wide open." Maybe the disclosure uh, project uh, will succeed. I can't imagine that it would, because no matter how many retired military officers, including general officers, that are willing to testify in front of Congress, you know, if they get immunity. You know, the people that run this thing have it so locked up, and there's so many things at stake, I can't imagine them letting go of it. A lot of people, of course, say, how could, any, how could anything this big, this monstrous, be held secret? Okay, well, we've heard that argument for years and years, and my of answer to that is, if you read the papers, if you're reasonably well-informed, if you read a couple of magazines and listen to the news you know about 5% of what's going on, and that's a maximum. There is so much secret stuff. Going, you know, in 1960s, uh, they had a big conference with the military and civilian contractors that everything had to move underground because of the fact that too many people were too observant. They could see trucks. They could see tanks. They could see supplies moving up, uh, above ground. So everything went underground, and the massive transportation systems underground are just, people wouldn't believe it. You know, a lot of people in the area that I live in, uh, which is not that far from, as you know, 
uh, as you're not, uh, from the secret areas, uh, they, they detect these underground deep rumblings uh, beneath our feet here in the desert, and you're suggesting there's good reason for that. Oh, absolutely. I think that uh, in 1989 is when we, uh, Bob and I met a truck driver who came to us to tell us a story, and they were making these huge caverns under the test site, and what they would do is set off these atomic bombs that were super clean that didn't leave any you know, radiation at all, and then uh, they'd go down and they'd, they'd uh, clean it out and they'd put walls. And, and uh, I think the things went down like a mile. And his job as a driver would be to drive his cement truck uh, around this circular uh, circular uh, uh, road all the way down to the bottom, pour cement, then wind all the way back up. And I think there were eight of them up there. We really have bombs that are that clean? Uh, supposedly. That's incredible. Uh, you would think such a clean bomb would have contemporary uses above ground. <laughs> or is that just something that is uh, is going to also be held secret, I guess, the fact that we even possess such thing? Well, I saw a picture the other day on the Internet of the bomb in Indonesia and the crater that it, it made. And the argument was that this was a mini-nuclear clean bomb. And, and if the picture was real, I mean... Normal explosives didn't make that. It, it had to be something else. Fascinating. All right, John, hold on. We're headed toward the top of the hour, and I am going to open the phone lines, and we're going to get your reaction and your questions and your comments about all of this, and it should be indeed interesting after such an incredible briefing and to see how all of you out there are assimilating this information. From the high desert, listen. You know, I, I understand it, it seems in, incredibly counterintuitive that somebody like myself would do a program like this about this subject, digging for this information, concentrating and boring in on this incredible topic, wanting to know the story, wanting to know the facts, wanting to know the truth, and yet when I'm read a litany of the truth, and then here are, uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to release this um, or not? I end up saying, no, I understand. That seems very, very, very counterintuitive, but it's it's my honest response. And well, I'm telling you, if you doubt, I would go back, you folks, and listen to the briefing that John gave me and put yourself in the seat, listen to all that information, and then really, really tell me, tell John, Send me an email. I don't care. Would you really release that information, understanding what it would do? Put yourself in the position and then answer the question. Maybe it's counterintuitive. I don't know. All right. John, uh, people want to talk to you. Ask some questions. Would that be all right? Yeah. It would be interesting. Um, uh, first time caller line, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Hello. Hi. What is your first name? Oh, hi. My, my first name is Dan. Okay, Dan. Yeah, I'm one of the uh, top 21 top secret military witnesses who went to Washington to testify the Disclosure Project back in 2001. I met with John and Rachel Nevada about 10 years ago with a group with Bob Lazar. There was a top secret document that was uh, directed to Magi Control uh, regarding that meeting in the Disclosure Book. I just wanted to um, say that I, one of the things I did, I handled uh, a fax thing on the Disclosure Project website, and we've got over 20,000 faxes that went into Washington, and I personally met with senators and Congress on Capitol Hill, mm -hmm. and the response has been, and I monitor all the responses, and it's been nothing greater than thank you, we'll keep your views in mind. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, thank John for coming out after 10 years and just wanted to let him know that... Uh, How many thousand faxes went? 20,000. 20,000 faxes. Okay, John, um, if you could talk to, I don't know, maybe Dr. Greer, for example, and you were to sit down with Dr. Greer and uh, talk to him about what he's doing, what would you say to him? Uh, now, Dr. Greer, is he the Disclosure Project? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, all the best. Just wish him all the best, huh? You, you wouldn't. It's not my decision. All I told you is what I would do. Now yeah. those guys, you know, the retired military officers that you know want to get this out, you know, all the best. I'm just glad it's not my decision. I know what they went through. 
I know the you know all the stuff that in the reasons why it should be done, and uh, you know I wish them all the best. Okay, wild card line. You're on the air with John Lear. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi, Art. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, what is your first name? My name is Pam. I'm from Tennessee. Oh, you sure are. Huh. All right, hon. What's what? <laughs> what's up? Uh, this is concerning nine one one. Okay. My husband is a Muslim from Iraq, and he has told me things since nine one one that has really kept me upset. And I'm beginning to believe now that I've heard from John that he is right. He told me that uh, uh, Bin Laden was not responsible for the towers. He told me that uh, it had something to do with the government. And I, I could not believe that our government would have anything to do with this. What kind of position is your husband in to know these facts? I don't know. He, he is on the news all the time. He gets on his computer and pulls up that Al Jazeera, Al I don't know how you say it, uh, paper. And, of course, he and his friends talk all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, he calls Iraq all the time. There are, in fact, um, uh, thank you, there are many people who uh, uh, believe as you do, uh, John, or are coming to believe that, that there's a great untold story about the whole 911 thing, and I guess there is. Uh, do you ever think there'll be full disclosure on that? No, not in a million years. Not in a million years. Any more than the full disclosure on the TWA 800. And the way that thing was covered up was just disgraceful. In your opinion, uh, there was no question it was a missile that brought that airplane down. Absolutely no question. Okay. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Good morning. Hello. 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 East of the Rockies? Yes. Wonderful. Art Bell, what a pleasure and a privilege. Uh, John, John Lear, yes. I would have to agree that uh, not in a million years... Uh, the government would admit to 9-11. I think uh, in some odd, twisted way, we need the financing to uh, have a, a, a somewhat rational reason to, um, uh, you know, extend our power. Okay, now, uh, realize I'm not saying our government had anything to do with that. No, no, I, I would agree. However, your information and, and, and you are you presently, like, kind of go out to the country and... and Look at the deer and enjoy the simplistic ideas of life. That's what I like. Yeah. Oh, I love that too. And Henry David Thoreau did that in a lot of things. And he was he was said to be uh, uh, someone that was against society. And sometimes, you know, we we fear what we don't understand. And I think, you know, kudos to to both of you. All right, sir. Well, th- thank you very much, John. Uh, the war itself uh, with Iraq. Any any comments on the war with Iraq? Um, I had two comments. Let's see if I can remember them. Hmm. I can't. Ask me a little while later. All right. Uh, West of the Rockies, you're on Oh, there. wait. Yeah, yeah, I remember. All right. Uh, number one, it's my opinion that Saddam Hussein died three years ago of limb cancer. And number two, we were tricked into that war. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay, tricked into the war. West of the Rockies, you're on there with John Lear. Hi. Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you and where are you? I'm, uh, God, I'm doing great. My name is Barbara and I'm from Laguna Beach. Okay, Barbara. California. Right. <laughs> and you good gentlemen are just a pleasure to listen to tonight. Thank you. I grew up around this stuff. My father was in SAC for over 30 years and he's got about 13 years on, on Mr. Lear. But um, the one thing I was really curious about is, um, is he ever thinking about writing a book about this? No. Sir, no. Because no. I would love to send that to my dad. I'd do everything to try to <laughs> shake my dad up. <laughs> okay, well... Uh, he won't give me any answers. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much for the call. And that's a, it is an interesting question in a way, John. Almost everybody who does the kind of stuff that you did with Bob and others and is aware of the kind of information you have. Everybody writes a book, but you're not going to do it, huh? 
Well, let me answer it this way. I once proposed after, you know, while this thing was going on with Bob Lazar, <clears throat> a little thing we could do to to harass Area 51. He said, John, we've tickled that dragon enough. Uh-huh. Yes. That's my answer as far as a book. I've tickled the dragon enough. Okay. First time caller line, you're on there with John Lear. Good morning. Hello? Yes. Hello, Art. Yes. Yes, uh, what a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you. Mr. Lear, yeah. I do have a question. Uh, you were saying that perhaps we may be someone else's experiment. Um, by extension, and I realize this is a bit over the top, but what do you think the possibility is that perhaps whoever they are, the entire universe is their experiment, in which case, for all practical purposes, they would be gods? Possibly. That's a very good point of view. Yeah, it is a point of view, um, and that would make them gods. But I mean, that, <laughs> I just finished uh, reading a book, a uh, very interesting book uh, called uh, "The Daughter of God." The premise being, there were two saviors, um, and the further premise be that the Catholic Church went to extraordinary lengths, I- I- including murder, to prevent that information from ever getting out, that it would so destroy uh, belief systems. Which information? Uh, that there had been a second savior. In fact, that uh, the second savior had been not male but female, and uh, hence the, the name, the title of the book, The Daughter of God. Uh, but even that kind of information would be so disruptive to society in general that people would be killed to prevent its release. Uh, that there were, uh, you know, the premise of the book was that there were hardcore facts that such a savior existed. And, of, of course, you can imagine, uh, at any rate, I don't want to ruin the book for anybody, but uh, that would be disruptive information. On the wild card line, you're on the air with John Lear. Good morning. Uh, good morning. It's so great to have you, Art. Uh, my question, Mr. Lear, is this. Some time ago, uh, a couple of years ago, you know, like most Art Bell fans, I fell asleep on the show and I woke up, so I don't know exactly who said this. But I woke up and I heard somebody say that the United States government was abducting people to work as slaves on the moon. It's bad enough if it's aliens, but our own government. Have you heard of this? Do you know whose theory this is? I, and how do the families I, of, of the world, how do they work into your general theories okay. as well? Uh, I've not heard such a rumor, John. No, I haven't. I haven't heard that. It sounds like somebody might say that, but uh, I haven't heard that particular now, in the briefing that you gave me earlier, you clearly alluded to the fact that uh, we'd had dealings with the aliens, that a deal had been cut to allow some abductions for whatever motivation and reason they wanted to do them in return for technology. Um, is that still the case as far as you know that we're being more or less shut out from uh getting this new technology that was promised? You know, that was... Um, I heard that about uh, 15 years ago, and, and Linda Moulton Howe was the one that originally gave me that information. <clears throat> uh, whether it's still going on, I don't know. I do know that the technology we have, uh, not only at our test site, and, and, you know, let me explain that Area 51 is just one of about 30 AAOs, air access only. Uh, at least there were 10, 15 years ago, and I'm, I'm sure there's at least that many. Uh, so all kinds of technology is going on. The problem is it's all so secret that they can't use any of it. Hmm. I read a story in the first call for that they had all kinds of stuff that they could use, but it was so, so secret they couldn't get a, a clearance to use it. <laughs> Ah, yes. Um, In an age where, you know, we're beginning to wonder where our next kilowatt is coming from, uh, when uh, the amount of coal and oil, or at least oil available in the world, is going to be, I don't know, 30 or 40 years within or even before that, it's going to start to choke us, and we need technological advance because we need power. Uh, so do you suppose some of this, I mean, you, you do have to suppose almost that some of these propulsion systems, for example, John, 
could be used to provide the power that the world needs and may have to end up going to war over if we don't get. Absolutely, but we can't make it. In other words, I mean, there's there's abundant power in antimatter reactors, but we don't have any way to contain it or make the fuel necessary. Now, they can, you know, the aliens can give us, you know, 100 uh, megawatt generators of the size of a, not a, uh, 100 megawatt generators the size of an ice chest, but, you know, that's just one. I don't think they'd supply them abundantly to us. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Hi, Art. Hi. Uh, This is Mike from Milwaukee. I just wanted to ask Mr. Lear a question. Okay. Uh, Has he ever heard of uh, James P. Hogan, the writer that wrote Inherit the Stars? No, I haven't. Okay. He wrote a very, that book called Inherit the Stars. That was all about a planet that's... uh, Supposedly where the uh, asteroid belt is was once a planet with humans on it, of course, and they became a space-faring race, and they moved in from there after they blew up their own planet as a war, war-mongering people. They moved on to Mars and then colonized it, and then, of course, that lost its atmosphere, and then they had scientists or whatever on the moon, our moon, that was actually around their planet in the first place, and it kept moving toward until Earth grabbed it. Anyway... This whole story sounds like basically what you're talking about, about the aliens saying that uh, they created us way back long, 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 long before we were even on the Earth. And that's where we get our uh, the so-called the pyramids and the uh, statues on Easter Island and all the other, you know, the, the Atlantis story and all these kind of things. It makes more sense than, it, uh, than, it, than, what, you're, than what you're putting out there. Well, that's of course... Realizing hold, hold, that on, hold on, caller. Okay, John. That's possible. I wanted to comment on the py- pyramids. I spent two years in living in Cairo, 1981 and 1982, and in those days I was pretty well uninformed. And I remember crawling around the, the pyramids and, and looking at the, the the absolutely enormity of them and how closely the stones fit. And that at that time, I certainly believed that you know a thousand, a million Egyptians rolled them up on. <laughs> logs up there, and now I, I look back and I wonder how I could have been so stupid as to right. think that. I mean, it's just <laughs> impossible. I, I I totally agree. So you're basically telling me after all these years of finding finding out that I'm just a, a Lilo and Stitch experiment 626, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the vessel that I'm walking around in is, you know, I wait in line and get back and get another and get another vessel after I'm done with this one, right? Absolutely. That all right. Is. That I, that that makes my life perfect. Thanks. I was I love that. Well, I oh. hope the current vessel occupancy is well for you, sir. Thank and you. Art, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Take care. All right. Um, west of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Hi, this is Rob calling from San Diego. Yo, Rob. Hi, Art. Uh, pleasure to hear you back on there again. I've been listening to you on and off for about eight years since I was a teenager in Anchorage, Alaska. It's been a while. Yes. Um, my comment on the subject goes to the morality of telling the truth okay. and of government not telling the truth. Okay. And... I heard the argument about disruption of society yes. as an argument for not releasing the truth, but in my opinion, the morality of telling the truth outweighs those possible consequences, and yes, there would be disruption, but ultimately, how many lives are wasted pursuing ideas that our government knows not to be true? Hmm. The moral argument, John, um, for the release of the information. Uh, when you when you look at it um, and balance the moral question, uh, obviously it comes out weighted on the side of not telling, right? Well, let me explain it this way. Have I talked about the ant farm yet? No, go ahead and talk about the ant farm. Remember how we used to have these little ant farms with the glass on both sides? I had one. Okay, so you're walking by one day, and if you could talk to the ant, the ant there staring out the window, he says, hey, what's going on? And you say nothing. He says, wait a minute. I have a right to know the truth. I want to know what's going on. What are you going to tell him? He's in an ant farm? You're in an ant farm. Um, If I chose to shake this right now, you'd all be toast. (laughs) 
Right. <laughs> I don't know. I've stepped on many of your kind without even thinking about it. <laughs> I don't know. There wouldn't be anything you could tell those ants that would uh, console them with regard to their position. <laughs> right. So why tell them anything? So why tell them anything? Um, I mean, there they are working and building those tunnels and everything. And, when, you know, they look out the window and see somebody and say, hey, what's going on? Uh, tell me know. the truth. Um... No, there'd be there'd no there really wouldn't be any upside to it. I, as it was, John, my ant farms frequently expired overnight. I mean, I'd I'd come the next morning and look for all the busy little work, and all I'd see is little bodies. Um, hold on, John. <laughs> Already, I'm getting hundreds of fast blasts requesting um, written copies of what John Lear said. John Lear's briefing. People are trying to figure out how to get to it on Streamlink, and they're going to dissect every single word of that briefing. And Lexi in Seattle, Washington says, Hey, Art, come on. Ants don't ponder the big question. Humans need, do need to know the truth collectively so that they can work on improving their situation. If we've been deceived, we need to know in order to find a solution or a way out. Don't deny us that. Well, I think John's just saying that he knows what he knows, which he laid out for you, and he's at terms with it, and at 60 years old, he's just decided he's going to enjoy life, and there is that, isn't there, John? Yeah, and let me make one small correction here. When I mentioned the second company that I had problems with over this UFO stuff, it was not Lockheed. It was a government contractor that I was flying a Lockheed L-1011. 1011, Okay. All right. Um, back to the phones. Most of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Hi. Mr. Bell. Uh, Mr. Caller. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, uh, it's an honor to be a part of such a, uh, an incredible program with you, Art Bell, and John Lear. First of all, you, you, I chuckled when you mentioned about the ant farms. I knew Milton Levine, Uncle Milty's Ant Farms, you remember? Oh, sure. He was in Hollywood. He'd, he'd send the people in the vans out in the desert. He'd pay them a penny apiece for every ant they brought back in. <laughs> John, God bless you. Um, I'm sitting here. I'm kind of choked up. I'm looking at a photo with your dad, Bill, and myself in his office at Stead at the air base there. Yeah. And also another photo with John Lear. You remember the geologist? Uh, uh, in, in, in tungsten specialty, and, and also Sam Old with the Lear fan, yeah. and myself. And I go back over 40 years with many of the mines, the gold mines and tungsten mines. A lot of things you talked about I was a part of. Yes, sir. Also, with your mother, I offered to put up the money to make the movie about your dad's life, and she thought that Robert Ehrlich would have played a good role of your dad. Yeah, yeah. And I... There's so much I'd like to talk to you about. I'd love to shake your hand. Love to shake Art's hand. I've listened to Art since the beginning. Yeah, it's been a long, it's been a long road. Uh, thank, thank you very much. I guess uh, somebody you knew in the past, John, or ran into somewhere, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you very much for those kind comments. I, I can't believe it. I thought I, all I was going to get was flack tonight. No, no, you never know on these lines. You really, honestly, never know, John. First time caller line, you're on the air with John Lear. Hi. Yes, hello. Is this the first time caller line? It is, yes. Well, my name is Ronnie, and uh, perhaps... Where, Mr. where are you? Ronnie, where are you? I'm uh, located in Santa Clarita, California. Okay. And uh, I might be giving John some flat tonight. <laughs> might be the one. All right. Well, let's hear it. Well, first of all, I want you to know that I'm of the Aganazi. And uh, we call ourselves today the Agane, and I know completely what's going on. And uh, John's knowledge is peripheral, to say the least. Uh, this whole universe is the hands of Lucifer. These that we are seeing are Lucifer. the watchers, and Lucifer has a hold of them. And what Lucifer is looking for is he's looking for DNA, and he's looking to clone. And so you, you then think that all these acts, these ships and these creatures, and they're all instruments of Lucifer, is that... That, that is correct. That is correct. Okay. Uh, well, there you go, John. So 
Um, he, I, I don't know whether he knows it or not, but he's making our case. I say our case because you and I do agree on disclosure, and I think that does make our case. I mean, there he is. There's the caller. Yeah. This is all the act of the devil. And, and I've, you know, I've, I've joked in the past, John, if a saucer landed and the ramp came down and a little green guy started walking down the ramp, uh, that caller and his brethren would fill that little green guy full of so much lead, he'd never get to the bottom of the ramp. Yeah. So... I mean, I mean that's it, it's it's not funny. It's 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 real. There are people who feel that all of this is the act of of the devil of yeah. Lucifer, and and they would act. Yeah. Uh, Wild card line. You're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Hello. Going once. Going Hello. twice. Are you there? Yes. Um. You you better answer pretty quick. Yeah, I'm here. P pick up that phone. I don't talk to people on those. Hello? Yes, that's a little better. Okay, let me turn it up. Just pick up the phone. All right, hang on. Jeez, <laughs> oh, well, you're going to yeah. go on a radio show. You don't use those things. All right. Um, yeah, I was just wondering if uh, Art, you know, or John, um, might have any idea as to uh, maybe why there's so much government uh, uh, opposition to the NRA. <laughs> uh, uh, you know uh, that's a political question well i was just thinking uh we as a human species um have something as precious as a soul i know i would fight you know these aliens with every source available oh i instead see instead of being shipped off on some train you know to some work farm or to be experimented on or butchered Okay, that's, you know, in, in a way, that's, that's a point, John, in a way. Uh, in other words, a certain part of the human race, if they really thought that we were everything that you described, would want to fight, you know, to the last drop of blood. I mean... For our soul? Uh, I guess against being uh, continued so. to experiment it on. Uh, no, in other words, we would want to be free. We would want to not imagine there are those experimenting on us and dabbling with us, and we would fight the bastards and kill them. You know, that's kind of what he was saying. Well, um, first of all, it's not our soul, it's theirs. So you might have temporary use of it, but <laughs> it belongs to them. <laughs> Oh, I wouldn't mess with that answer. All right, East of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. 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 Yes, yes, where are you, sir? Yes, I am in Illinois. Okay. And my name is Laverne. Okay, Laverne. And uh, I am I am an opponent of this thing. Uh, back in the 1850s, people who hated Yahweh and Yeshua were quick, quick to adopt uh, Darwin's evolutionary theory to their own scientific ventures and made it look like it was scientific itself. But now the Darwin's theory has been effectively disproven. New, new theories are being brought forth, lest the people should again give the Yahweh Yeshua the glory. And this is Satan's work, as far as I'm concerned. All right, sir. I, I appreciate the call and uh, the reinforcement. I rest my case. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I know. And, I, I you know, I hope people are listening to this. I mean, out of the few calls that we've taken... Uh, there already is, I don't know, factor two into how many we've taken. And these people would, uh, they'd, they'd shoot aliens. They'd kill aliens. They would, uh, as quickly as they could, brand them uh, as instruments of the devil himself and go after them. So, hey. West of the Rockies, you're on there with John Lear. Hello. Yeah, hello. Hi. Uh, what, is you your, what is your name? My name is Gillian. Gillian, and where are you? I'm in Rockland, California. Okay, rock on then. Yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, listen, uh, I, while I was dialing, because I was going to ask a different question, but as I was dialing, um, Mr. Leah had a question about 9-11, and someone asked him, and I wish I could ask my original question, but I, this has got me so curious. Go ahead. Someone asked him a question about 9-11, and would he tell, and he said, and I couldn't get the whole question, and that's why I'm 
that's why I stayed on the phone for an hour. But he said something like, um, no, I would never in a million years tell you. And I would love to know what he meant by that and why he said it. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, I would assume uh, the answer, John, would remain the same. Yeah, I don't remember. I don't think that had to do with 9-11. <laughs> Uh, first time caller line, you're on the air. Hello. 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 Oh, yes, you're you're on. Oh, my name is Nancy. I'm in Sunnyvale, California. Okay. And I believe you. And I just want to uh, figuratively shake your hand. And I'd like to tell you that as I've been listening to your program, I've been writing. Uh, some free verse, and if you would uh, listen to what I have to say. Not to re read a poem, no, ma'am. Well, no, it's not that that long. Uh, no, I, even even a short poem. Thanks anyway, but we don't uh, read poems on the program. Um, Wildcard line, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Hi, this is John from Dublin, California. How you doing tonight? All right, John. How are you? Doing good, thanks. Uh, I have a question for John of uh, any sort of stuff he has to say about the, the Tehachapi Ranch area and what might be going on down there. The where? The Tehachapi Ranch. That's part of all this complex. Yeah. That's part of everything that's going on. Is Are all of these areas, um, as many have, I mean, we did talk about underground a little while ago, John, but are all of these sensitive areas tied together underground? Yeah, most of them. Um, some of them have, some of them are strictly to do with, uh, you know, current uh Air Force and Navy technology, uh, some of them with uh, uh, strictly civilian technology. Now, uh, the uh, whoever the government is pulled a real slick one here about, oh, maybe eight years ago because of all the stuff that was going on in, um, in ufology uh, close to Las Vegas. They decided to take a number of top officials to a secret area out in uh, north of the test site where the 737s go, which has nothing to do with UFOs. It's strictly, uh, you know, a radar installation, but it is underground and it's very, very secret. And they took them there for the express purpose to say, hey, look, you know, this is what we going on. All that UFO stuff is, is BS. Huh. It was a very, very smart move. East of the Rockies, you're on the air with... Uh with John Lear. Where are you, please? I'm in Jacksonville, Florida. This okay. Is Robert. I find this a very fascinating subject. I, I commend you, sir, you and Bob Lanier and, and uh, Art Bell and, and Richard Hogan and all you people because we have the entity that's uh, the uh, subvertive group of people those people like you that are working on the other side of it to make us aware of what we are, um, with the trail that we are going down, I find it very, very fascinating. I'd love to see when the Chinese get up to the moon and some <laughs> of the other places what's going to happen yes. when, their, when their vehicles start uh, malfunctioning allegedly like ours were when we start going to the moon and to Mars and places like that. It's, it's really a fascinating subject, no matter what, whether we're guinea pigs or not. Well, it may be, uh, and you might want to comment on this, John, that the Chinese, although completely different than, than us in most respects, may find their own reasons to not want to make this public. To, to not want to show us up and say here's here's the truth and shove it in our in the in the U.S. government's face and the rest of the world's face, uh, they may have their own reasons for not wanting to make it all public, huh? No, knowledge is power. Why share it? Yeah, why share it? West of the Rockies, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 Um, my question is. Um, there's something yeah. wrong with your phone there, hon. It's going click, click. I know. I can't figure out what it is. Okay, then go ahead. Okay, I'm trying to figure out, though. Um, my question is why, if you believe that the UFO people are our God, wouldn't that make what we're believing in right now a lie? <laughs> John? Okay, hold on, dear. John? No, we're not saying they're God. They're in charge of the experiment. If you want to call them God, fine, but but they're not God. 
um, but in some ways, uh, you come to that conclusion. I mean, our makers, our creators, uh, the controllers of the experiment, I don't know. If we, uh, if we ever create... Well, I'm going to take one last question. First time caller line, you're on the air with John Lear. Hello. Yes, this is Leif from West Texas. Okay, we don't have and a lot of time, so fire no, away. Well, I was, uh, the obvious seems to have missed everybody and that in that be... um, with the sun uh, problems, the end of the Mayan calendar, um, the next Noah's Ark is 144,000. Uh, who gets to pick? Who goes? It's 144,000 watt. Well, that's just an analogy. All right. of the uh, Nostradamus, the Bible, and everything else, the end of the world type thing, these people may be collecting samples to reseed next time. And the reason oh. people in government, people need to stop saying government. It's people in government yes. that make these decisions. So, anyway, who gets to pick who goes? I wouldn't tell the rest of the billions of people on earth that there's not room for them and i'd especially try to take guns from them <laughs> all right sir thank you very much john our time is v very quickly coming to an end anything else you want to get out before nope. we're done nope that's it that's it. Oh, that's enough so you are now going to resume uh, your your life of uh, enjoyment, and, and and I hope you are having a good time. Your family all okay? Everybody fine? Everybody's great. Up until <laughs> tonight. Up until tonight. Well, uh, hopefully, what people will take away from tonight is all the all those words in the briefing, and they'll be chewed over a million times, John. So you've you've given us plenty to think about, and I don't know how I can thank you for consenting to come back on this program one more time. Okay, all right. Good night. Good night. That's John Lear. <laughs> That's a lot to think about, isn't it? And I do recommend that you do that, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, get a copy, a text copy of John Lear's briefing tonight. I had no idea that was coming, incidentally. None at all. Uh, type it out. Remember the words, get it on Streamlink, uh, do whatever you're going to do, and then sit down and I ask you, reflect on it heavily, very heavily. Assume it's true for the sake of the question that he posed to me and now the same one that I turn around and pose to you. And that is, knowing all of that as actual fact, would you then go ahead and consent to everybody's knowing? to a sudden release of all of that incredibly frightening, societal changing information. What would you do with it? Answer that question honestly, and then fire me off an email or something, if you would. And again, I want to thank John Lear for being here. Uh, one last incredible kind of program, and I wish his life goes on well. And please don't bug John now that he's been on the air. Uh, please don't, uh, please don't bug him. Uh, let him do as he would like to do, and that is live his life out happily with his family. As for me, that'll do it for this. Oh, what a weekend this has been! See you next.